Okay, I'm calling the Committee of the Whole meeting for April the 17th, 2017 to order. And I will begin by asking Deputy Mayor Henderson if there are additions to the agenda. Uh, yes, Mayor Brockenier, there are a number of items. I'm asking the following items be added as addendums to the original agenda. Max LaMarchant, delegation regarding the road allowance rail crossing at lot 24 and 25 concession A, town of Coburg. The Coburg Legion minor softball, delegation to request support of the 2017 softball season and the under 16 boys fastball fast pitch national championship. A memo from the treasurer regarding the 2016 remuneration and expense reports. Memo from the marina manager regarding the barrier-free washroom renovation project at Coburg Marina. A memo from the director of planning and development regarding the site plan approval. Development agreement at 680 Ontario Street, Crystal Gardens. A memo from the director of planning and development regarding an application for site plan amendment. Amending development agreement 82 and 86 Monroe Street. I'd ask that these items be again be added to the agenda. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. That's almost the whole agenda. <laughs> uh, I'll, I, I, Ms. Price? Okay. Any discussion on the motion to add all to the agenda? All in favor? It's carried. Are there any declarations of interest from members of council tonight? Seeing none, we may proceed, Ms. Brace. Your Worship, we have a presentation by William McCree and Lisa Cullen, SEMA presentation of the Victoria Square Phase 4 design concept, and they are both in attendance to speak. Okay. Well, welcome both uh, Lisa and William. Please step up to the uh, dais, and, and I, would, I would ask you to make sure that you, you speak very clearly into the microphone. We've had some difficulty because we're, stre we're streaming live and uh, some of the feedback we've had from the people at home is that they don't hear, they can't hear quite as well as they should be able to. So thank, okay. thank you. Thank you, Your Worship and members of council. I think uh, CAO uh, would like to uh, say a few remarks first and then uh, Malcolm Wardman of the uh, Victoria Square Committee would like to uh, address council before we speak, so. Ab absolutely. Malcolm. Thank CAO you very first. much. I'm very happy to introduce tonight to Council the exciting Victoria Square Phase 4 plans. A re review of the work that has occurred in the past year would include the formation of the Victoria Square Phase 4 Committee, which was a committee com uh, consisting of representation of every advisory committee in the town of Coburg. It was felt that this approach would provide the widest possible perspective for such an important plan, and I think you'll see the results bear that out. Under the leadership of Chair Malcolm Wardman, the, this hardworking committee initially produced a concept plan that was endorsed by Council and now have completed the detailed planning work. It is this work that you'll be seeing tonight. It was originally intended this committee to have Council proceed with the work in time for Canada 150. Unfortunately, the request for grants from federal and provincial funding uh, sources did not occur. Planning work continued with the goal of having a shovel-ready project available for applications for future grants requests. Tonight we have representation of CM, CIMA Plus who will present the detailed plans. But before we begin, I would like to ask the Mayor to ask Chair Wardman to provide some background and context to a project that began back in 1999. He will then introduce the committee and the consultant who will present the design. Absolutely. Uh, Malcolm, welcome. I think as Chair of this committee and, and, and of course your involvement going back to 1999, we. We should hear a few words uh, from you before we go into the, the, uh, the presentation itself. Th thank you, Mr. Mayor. <coughs> uh, I'm, stand I'm standing here tonight with a feeling of deja vu uh, because 20 years ago, in 1997, I was appointed chair of the Victoria Square Committee, and in December 1999, after two years' study, we presented our proposed design of the square for the approval of council. And here I am again, 20 years later. <coughs> Two other members of the original team are also uh, <coughs> involved. Miriam Mooton, who was the design consultant for the 1999 plan, and <coughs> so, sorry, 
<coughs> and also the 2017 plan. Jim Dow was our 1999 engineering consultant and is also a member of our 200, the 2017 uh, committee. After council approval of the plan in 1999, and as no town funds were available, we decided to proceed with construction in stages by the sale of name pavers. This received strong report support from the public. We also received generous financial sponsorship support for the two fountains, the landscaping and street furniture from Coburg service clubs and private citizens. Between 1999 and 2005, we raised 300,000, and as money came in, we built another phase of the project. And the Town Works Department assisted with improvements to the adjacent roads. However, after six years completing three phases, we ran out of funds and energy to complete final phase four of the project, and the ad hoc committee was disbanded. My committee members were disappointed but proud of the improvements we had made to the area which was a sea of asphalt and park and vehicles before we started. <clears throat> you will see from a photograph in tonight's presentation the condition of the surroundings in the park at that time. My committee members were disappointed but proud of the improvements we had made to the area <clears throat> and as it was Sorry. I was overjoyed when this project was rejuvenated in June 2016, and I was asked to be the chair of a 20-plus member committee to finish the project under its new title, the Coburg Market Square, a name chosen by a survey of the public. Since June 2016, this committee has worked extremely hard with the consultants on a twice monthly meeting basis to respond to the concerns of the handicapped, market vendors, theater requirements, environmental concerns, public art, traffic, etc. Feedback was obtained from all the interest groups and a public meeting was held on September the 15th, 2016 and council and committee approved the final concept plan on October the 24th, 2016. It would, be, it would be remiss of me to not mention at this time the following members of the committee for their efforts, which have kept us on a tight schedule so that we are here tonight actually on time from the schedule we predicted uh, back in June 2016. Elena Asselin, Farmer's Market, Jack Boyagian, Northumberland Players, Gudrun Ludroff Weaver, Planning and Sustainability, Cheryl Blodgett, Accessibility, Julie Dreyer, DBIA, Florence Fletcher, Victorian Operatic Society for the Theatre, Jim Dow, Engineer and Public Art, Richard Randall, unfortunately is now deceased, Heritage and Public Art, Kevin Ward, Coburg Chamber of Commerce, Thomas Cochran, Coburg Economic Development, Randall Ross, Environment, Miriam Mooton, Design Consultant, Ken Jansen, Parks and Public Art, Jeff Hurst, Transportation. And of course, we were given substantial help by staff Stephen Peacock, Ian Davy, Craig Lever, Glenn McClash, and Alison Tory LePere, Barry Thrasher, Laurie Wills, Dean Huswick and Sari LeBanc, and last but most important, Mayor Brockenier and Councillors Deborah McCarthy and Susan Seguin. I now wish to introduce our engineering consultants, Wilf McRae and Liza Cullen of SEMA, who joined our group in December 2016 and will make the presentation on our behalf of the, first, of, of the final engineering designs of Coburg Market Square for the approval by council. Now I hand it over to you, Will. Thank, thank, well, first of all, thank you very much, Malcolm. And uh, I would be remiss, since I was the one who nominated you to take uh, the chair's role in this fourth phase of Victoria Square, 
I would be remiss if I didn't thank you for all the work that you have contributed to Victoria Square over the last 20 years. So thank you on behalf of Council. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. Thank you, Malcolm. Thank you, uh, Stephen. So uh, we are going to try to, we've got a, a number of slides here. Uh, most of them are visual, so hopefully we can work through them fairly quickly. If you have any questions, uh, certainly feel free to to uh, put, put up your hand and, and ask, and we can uh, answer those questions as we go through or let you know that the answer will soon be coming. Um, I'm uh, the office manager for SEMA in Bowmanville, and I'm an engineer by trade. Lisa is a landscape architect, and together we're able to kind of bring together the... Uh, the the uh, technical and uh, and uh, kind of landscape architecture feel that you're looking for in Victoria Square. So, uh, with that project background, we're going to now step into the kind of detailed design realm and show you what we've come up with with a lot of help from the uh, the committee. It was a very interactive process and and very helpful. We'll focus on uh, the parking and roadway design development uh, along Second Street, surface treatments, uh, low impact development. Uh, some of the site furniture we've picked out, planting, public art, and lighting design. There's engineering drawings that have been prepared that kind of go along with this stuff, but again, our, our presentation here is, is more visual with some help of a 3D model. So I think this is a picture that Malcolm was referring to. You can see in 1990, that's when my wife and I moved to town, and you can see things have changed quite a bit since then. So pavement and vehicles was the uh, order of the day back in those days, and you could go to Quigley's Hardware and get well treated and buy all of your, your stuff, but uh, no curbs, a lot of pavement, a lot of asphalt. You look out there today, we've, we've moved forward uh, with uh, the upgrading of Albert Street, the condos have been built, Rotary Park, so I think this is just an evolution of that process where we can now tie all of that stuff together with, uh, with the Victoria Square project. So these were the uh, concepts that uh, Miriam and the committee uh, pulled together um, and this is the basis that we had to work with when we were brought on board to do the detailed work in, uh, in December as Malcolm has, has noted. This is a uh, quick video. I might have to press the square button for this, I'm not sure. Oh, somebody's got it under control. So again, this gives you an indication. This was, uh, this was prepared by Marian Mouton, uh, Mouton Landscape Architecture with the help of Jer Jeremy Nichols. Yeah, a little bit choppy. But it gives you an idea, maybe we can move to the next slide, it gives you an idea of, uh, of the atmosphere that we're trying to create. This is entering the square from, uh, from Second Street and moving to the south. So you can uh, see how you're getting away from a traffic vehicle oriented environment into uh, a people friendly place, more geared towards pedestrians and, uh, and uh, other activities related to, uh, to people. So this gives you an overview of where we've evolved now. So this is the plan that we're going to be uh, go going to be speaking to. We're going to use a 3D model to uh, to kind of give you an idea of what uh, it will look like when it's built. That uh, is the way we like to communicate rather than using our technical engineering drawings. So when we were brought on board, the first thing we did was uh, survey the property, got all of the information about the underground utilities, so we could see how all of this built form would interact with the environment that was already out there and uh, identify any issues or problems that, that needed to be dealt with. So we'll, um, so this is, you know, this is tied to real, real coordinates all in, um, all dimensionally correct and all of those kinds of things. So when we look at uh, the first view, there's three modes that we were asked to work with. So that's business mode, which is this, which is primarily geared towards uh, parking uh, in the square with Albert Street being open to traffic and Second Street uh, providing a, a secondary access from the north, uh, one way southbound. And um, you know this is how the square would be programmed on a on a on a day-to-day -day basis. The second mode is for market mode, so the farmers market that runs from May to December. Um, 
there is an opportunity to accommodate uh, with the reconfigured square. I think we figured 41 10 by 10 tenths. You might not need to use Albert Street initially, but uh, the idea is there that you can use that street. And the reason you can do that is because all of this is going to be at grade. We're going to be removing all of the curb and gutter, and it's going to be one great big flat surface that will, will be programmable in a number of different ways. And the third mode is uh, event mode. So you can see here, and we'll get into a lot more detail on this as we progress through the presentation, but you've got three possible stages, one on the east side of the fire hall, one out in front on the south side of the fire hall, and one on the east side of the market building. Again, an opportunity for tents, an opportunity for some um, uh, formal seating areas, and a lot of area to accommodate people. So you could look at this, uh, the trends you see today, with all of uh, the success of the Toronto sports franchises. You can look at the setup they have for uh, Jurassic Park when the Raptors play, or for Maple Leaf Square when the Leafs play. You could, you could uh, picture that being full of people for, for special events that would be programmed there. Uh, there's just an example again in event mode of, of uh, seating. Um, this is a, a very simple form of a building that uh, we're hoping will be built in the future on that, on that property. There are several development proposals and several developers that are interested in building on that property and I think that's, you know, this project could be a catalyst that would really help to, to bring that along uh, more quickly when they see how their building can be programmed relative uh, to to the square itself. So um, I think there's there's could be some very very important synergies there. So again, I'm just going to uh, go through a few slides here that'll talk about the square when it's in business mode and talk about the transportation aspects because that's what I do. I'm an engineer, and then Lisa will get into things uh, in a little more more detail in terms of some of the uh, landscape features and other uh, programming of the square. So this is approaching the square uh, from 2nd Street moving south. Again, the idea is to make it more of a people place even when it is in business mode. So that starts by when you come by the proposed, uh, or the end of the proposed uh, new building, the north end, that would be a driveway that uh, is just off to your right on the screen, is to have a uh, um, what we call a, a large speed table. So you have to drive up from the paved asphalt surface onto the interlocking brick surface. Now what we're trying to do is, is provide a form that makes drivers want to slow down and take caution. So to do that, we're implementing uh, a series of, of bollards, keeping trees close to the road, other, other uh, street furniture to give people uh, a, a sense that they're confined when they're driving into the square, slowing down, and uh, paying attention to, uh, to what's around them. So again, here are the bollards. We're looking at three different types of bollards, a flexible style bollard so that if uh, the fire department has to access the square, they don't have to be uh, very delicate when they enter from the, uh, from the, uh, from the, from the, the north. They can run over the bollards and they'll bounce back up. We're going to have uh, steel cylindrical bollards that'll be um, have electrical outlets in them and uh, will be used to uh, power up the uh, market uh, displays and things like that and then the traditional Victorian bollards that will kind of tie what's going on on King Street and down in Rotary Park together through throughout the square. Edging uh, in order to provide guidance for vehicles instead of using a typical catch basin uh, storm sewer system, we're going to use a linear drain which will demarc the edge of the road in critical areas. Next slide is another view showing as you now get into the square from 2nd Street, we'll have a, a demarked pedestrian crossing and all of the pedestrian crossings, there was a lot of discussion at, the, uh, at our meetings about what the pedestrian environment should look like uh, when we're in business mode. And it was decided that we need to kind of stick with traditional sidewalk treatments because that's what our children and um, other people with disabilities are used to in terms of wayfinding and finding their way around. So all of the sidewalks, all of those gray areas are kind of traditional concrete sidewalks that mark safe places to walk around the square when it's in business mode. 
Once we get down to Albert Street, this is approaching the square from the east, just out in front of Rotary Park. Again, we have another speed table and ride up with onto the, onto the brick surface, which will slow people down. We have uh, gates which can be closed to uh, close off the square when it goes into its other modes. And again, the concrete sidewalk to provide clear definition for pedestrian traffic. And again, this is the liquor store, so we're approaching the square from the west. Again, that same concept of driving up into the square. You know you're entering a different place. You have to pay attention. You've got bollards to, re to uh, kind of restrict your width. The roadway will be, uh, the roadway surface that you're intended to drive on will be six meters wide. It'll be narrower than a lot of the other roads that are in town, so people will feel constrained. There's a few opportunities for on-street parking. These trees will eventually grow and again act as a gateway into the square. So it will uh, provide a lot of, a lot of um, uh, stimulus to drivers to, to pay attention to where they are and to, uh, to slow down. And again, the entrance to the parking from uh, Albert Street will be delineated because the surface is all flat and we don't have our, our traditional typical curbs that show us where to drive. Um, we'll be using street furniture and bollards to, demarc to demarcar demarcate the entrance. And uh, that way, again, we have that open feeling and the ability to program the square for, uh, for different events. Uh, Lisa's going to talk to you about surface treatments and a lot of other details that uh, relate to the program pro programming of the square for other events. So for the pavers, um, we're keeping the upper surface all consistent. So this is at the top of the wall areas. Um, and we're looking at using the existing name pavers that are there and then relocating other pavers from areas of the square that would be changed where those pavers match these ones. So it's taking the entire upper level at the top of the stairs and walls and making it consistent so that it's continuous through the whole way. And for the lower level, uh, Will talked about the sidewalk so that we've got our consistent concrete sidewalk as a recognizable element uh, that's good for accessibility to continue down Albert Street and 2nd Street and also through the west part of the square at the lower level. Um, it's placed close to the walls so that we have a tactile element there for people using canes. Um, and it's bordered by a dark colored banding, um, also in pavers, with a textured surface, so that that provides a tactile and visual contrast as well. Uh, the paver that we're looking at for the main part of the square is the top left there. It's a herringbone pattern because that's the strongest um, pattern placement for vehicular traffic. Uh, the other one's just the, the look of a darker paver there and it has sort of an exposed aggregate surface so that it provides that tactile difference. Um, sustainability and low impact development. We're looking at getting soil cells in for some of the trees along Albert Street so that we can maximize the tree growth and the canopy effect over the street over time. Um, and we would be using permeable pavers above those soil cells in order to reduce the surface runoff and increase the water available for those trees to help them grow. Uh, we're also looking at using the permeable pavers in the central area of the square. Um, and that, that spot will create a bit of a test area for future projects to see how the water is draining away with that permeable application. So some fundraising opportunities. The top slide there is showing that darker banding that borders the sidewalk. So really the sky's the limit on how many pavers could be sold for this. There's a lot of potential space. Um, so it could line certain areas of the sidewalk with opportunities to increase in the future as more pav pavers are sold. Uh, the bottom photo there is an example of some granite pavers at a park in Colborne where they were engraved um, at, at a cenotaph. Uh, so other fundraising opportunities, the engraved pavers and then bike racks. People could sponsor a bike rack, uh, put plaques on benches, have people purchase a tree. So there's quite a few opportunities for public involvement and fundraising. 
So the site furniture, we're looking at keeping the existing bench that's the top right there, um, that's used consistently throughout the downtown now. And the bottom photograph of the, a three-phase uh, waste receptacle, so it has three separate compartments. Um, so for waste recycling and organics, which is what the county is moving towards in the next couple of years. And then for planters, we'd be using uh, ones that are similar to those along the front side of Victoria Hall and others that are out in front of uh, Rotary Waterfront Park right now, just to keep that consistent, to be using it to demarcate traffic and also uh, the central area, and of course to look good. Uh, bike racks, the bottom left is a typical sort of post and ring, but it can be customized to say Coburg Market Square or Town of Coburg. Uh, then we have the multi bike rack version that holds more bikes at a time. Um, and then the other three, there are some possibilities to create sort of a, a functional art element. So custom bike racks that have a, a funky twist that fit in with Coburg and provide something kind of kind of fun. So this is a view of the market building. Um, notice the piano player there. We've got a, a new spot for street pianos. Um, so this, this shows the, the walls and the seating and the placement of the sidewalk close to those wall areas, but it leaves lots of clearance still around that area. Um, the railings that are shown there could be removable so that the stage area can be built out for larger performances. And this is a view looking west right at the market building. Um, that column there is the location of one of the public art features and I'll touch on that a little bit more shortly. Um, and the bollards that are there, those ones would be the steel bollards that are sort of marking off the traffic parking stalls. And the one there has a barrier free sign, which could be removed if there was a performance happening on the, on the stage areas. And this is looking east into the square from the north side of the market building. So we have a ramp going down there through that grade change. So that provides us an accessible um, point to get up and down and those um, there would be a spot there where vehicles could get down as well if they're needing to get um, props or something down to the stage areas for setup. And you can see our central pole there that we're going to be touching on a little bit more. So this is market mode uh, from above and Will had touched on that. This is showing 41 10 by 10 tents. Um, currently there's about 30 to 35 vendors, but that's expected to increase um, very shortly and then more over time as the as this project progresses. Um, so the, the tents could also continue all the way along Albert Street when the streets are closed. So, and you could have a double row there, like the sky's really the limit for the number of uh, vendors that you could incorporate into this plan. So this is looking north with the market building on the left and it shows you how the tents are laid out uh, with the, the sidewalk. So the 10 by 10 tent fits between the bollards and the sidewalk leaving lots of clearance still to get past vendors um, and the sidewalk tie in there off to the, the stairs at the side. Another view, this is looking west from kind of within the straight in the square during market mode. And that's looking east again, sort of from the, the ramp area. So you can see the tent layout along the north side of the square there as well. And you can see the, um, the seating walls. So there's, there's steps going up and then the, the double steps. So it's a, really a seating wall location that's just an informal spot to hang out without having a lot of furniture that's gonna clutter up the area during event mode. So a little bit on tree planting. The top photo there, we have a tree grate that would match the trench drain. So it's a really beautiful cast iron um, piece that sort of gives a decorative element while providing function. 
And to have these on trees, it just opens up the sidewalk space available around trees. Uh, we're looking at keeping the existing trees along 2nd Street until the construction of the future development happens. So we would be using the existing curb line as the delineation point. So the, we'll talk a little bit more about phasing in a few minutes, but um, that curb line gives us a spot where the first phase can stop and then everything east of it stays. So those existing trees would remain until the future development because we don't want to build that part and then have to muck it all up when the development happens. Uh, we're looking at using soil cells along some of the trees in Albert Street and trying to incorporate that into the future development on 2nd Street as well. Uh, the, the trees that we're proposing are ginkgos along um, Albert Street, which matches in with the largest ginkgo I know in town, right out in front of the, the Coburg Jail there. Um, and London, tr London Plain trees up 2nd Street, and then Honey Locust kind of within the squares in some other areas. Public art. Uh, we have the maquette on the left there for the, the public art that was chosen by the committee. And the photo on the right shows you the scale. So those black columns are about 13 feet tall. And we've been working on coordinating the footing and the lighting requirements for those pieces of art. And they are located where the red stars are. So it's kind of marking the four corners of the main part of the lower square. So this is on the east side of the Fire Hall Theater, and it's just showing a potential um, band set up with lots of seating out front across 2nd Street. And there's a view from the north looking down at the, the band members. And you can get quite a big crowd in there. And that's really one of the smaller of the three stage areas too. Uh, touching on lighting, we're looking at using the traditional coach top lanterns on 16 foot poles to match the uh, downtown lighting that's there now. So that would be along Albert Street and 2nd Street. And then through the rest of the square, we're looking at putting in a, a more decorative element for a central pole that will support all kinds of different types of lighting. So um, we're proposing a pole in the center that's gonna look like a mast with spreaders on it that can support the light fixtures. Um, and there's, so the fixture at the bottom there that's shown is like an accent lighting. It can be color changing LED uh, floodlights to light up the stages. Um, so we're looking at having four poles that are off at the sides and then one in the middle of the square that's taller. Uh, there's also a floodlight Feature. Oh, this is showing the lighting intensity uh, when we were talking to a lighting consultant about this. Um, and then some other feature lighting that's uh, potential. So you can be projecting words or images onto buildings or the ground. So for Christmas Magic and the Waterfront Festival, you could have um, the names of those events projected and you could have maple leaves and... Um, snowflakes or whatever you want like there's there's all kinds of neat different lighting things that can become art really and the spotlights on the poles will also serve to light the art as needed the public art so our central pole feature shown on the left uh, we would have um, okay so the spreaders holding the the lighting and then the boom coming out at the bottom, which would hold the stays. I got my terminology right here, Will. <laughs> um, so we could have banners along that saying Coburg Market Square or customized for different um, festivals and events. And then the photo in the middle there is showing how this pole could be dressed up during Christmas magic with strings of lights. And the other two show the different ways that you could light up the wires on this post or put flags on them as another feature. So it's really tying into the, the waterfront. 
So just a quick overview again of the three modes. So this is uh, market mode, sorry, business mode, showing it with uh, cars in the parking lot and on the streets. The streets are open to traffic. And then market mode. Um, and you notice in the foreground on the right there, we've got a, a flag. So that would be one of three flags that um, there's a separate project that we're looking at getting three flags into Rotary Waterfront Park there. So that's just tying in with um, this project quite nicely. And it lines up perfectly with that sidewalk looking down 2nd Street. So here we are in event mode. Uh, there's tables set up along the east side of 2nd Street tying into the proposed development. This is showing a one meter setback for that building, so it creates a little bit more sidewalk space. And then there's an overhang on the second floor of that building. Uh, but there's lots of potential for patio areas out in front of the, the building if there's cafes or restaurants. And then with a change to the liquor license, there's also the potential to set up patio space within the square. So I've, we've shown that there as well in a little sort of fenced area. And this is showing the stage at the south side of the Fire Hall Theatre. So that's built out over top of the stairs and the seating steps. And then it's got like separate scaffold lighting over top of it. So this would be for larger um, events or festivals that would be happening on stage. And I'll turn it back to Will to talk a little bit about the budget. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, we've got two more slides left here. So this is just a breakdown uh, of the detailed plans and uh, the various costs involved with the various segments. So right now, based on what we have uh, proposed on the plans and our best estimate of what the construction market is, is uh, telling us today, it's the total project cost to kind of put all this in place would be about $1.5 million. And I think there um, has been about uh, 1.2, 1.3 million dollars was kind of the original budget that was put together. So we put together a little bit of a phasing plan here, in terms of how you might implement uh, the project in a in a, in a financially uh, responsible manner. So again, as Lisa mentioned at the beginning, the curb lines along the uh, east side of Second Street, we're using those as a grade tie-in. The curbs are all going to be pulled, and the brick will be brought right into interface with the sidewalk over there. But we're going to, we, we don't need to necessarily disturb the trees and, and all of the infrastructure that's in that, in that boulevard until this building is built. Otherwise, it'll all get disturbed again through the construction process. So we can, we can uh, discount some of that out. That's uh, about $175,000. Again, likewise, when you're building the square, the grade we've designed will tie into the, uh, the existing curb line on the, uh, north side of Albert Street, so you could you could build that piece of Albert Street separately and just get this main part of the square done initially. And again, that uh, part of uh, south side of Albert Street is about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of work. Again, that could be phased and discounted. And again, the piece of the market building is about seventy thousand dollars worth of work. So you could phase it in over time, uh, year after year. Perhaps you know you're successful with your next funding application with some of the more detailed work having been done, and you can do it do it all at once. But there are certainly opportunities in terms of how you could phase the work to ma to make it fit with the initial budget that you uh, put forward. I think the critical part is to have the overall plan so you know how it all fits together, and you get uh, your duct work underneath the square for electrical connections and those kinds of things. We've uh, one of the items that wasn't in the uh, original budget was a replacement of a sewer. So there's an old sewer that runs out under, underneath the middle of the square for connecting to Victoria Hall. Before we put all of this good material on top, we want to make sure that the sewer is replaced and uh, will be there for a long, long time. So those are some of the things that we've picked up on through the detailed design process. And I think that's it. I think we're looking for any questions, if, if there are any. Well, thank you very much, Lisa and Will. Uh, very, very impressive project design, and I know that uh, it's been many months in the, mo in the making, um, but certainly worthwhile because I, I think you've nailed it dead on, 
And uh, I too want to uh, send my appreciation to the, the committee members and uh, as, again, Malcolm as chair, uh, our staff that helped to, you know, to guide us through this process and also to uh, Miriam Mutan who it did engaged the, uh, the committee members so well. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to open it up to members of council who may have um, comments or questions. Okay, uh, Councillor McCarthy's first, then Councillor Darling. Thank you, Your Worship, and, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, my last uh, meeting with the committee was January 26th when I changed portfolios and, and uh, Councillor Sagan took over, and I am gobsmacked at the evolution of this project since then. Um, I, I am so pleased to see the demarcation of the walkways for, um, with respect to accessibility issues because that was a major concern for those committee members. Um, you've also ramped it up a notch, quite a notch, with the lighting because that was not in the original project. And lighting, we know, just adds to any event in there. Um, and I also want the committee or the council and the public to know that uh, Lisa had an extensive meeting with the Accessibility Committee, brought in the actual pavers and the grids for the uh, water drainage, and, and they were touched and, and looked at or, or felt if there were visual impairments, and that had a tremendous impact. So in terms of a process consultation and, and the, the weaving in of the environmental aspects, I do have a question. <laughs> I'm just, like I said, in, in two months, it's staggering what's brought, been brought to the table. Do I assume that transit is rerouted? Yes, I would think with Albert Street closed that transit would have to, would have to be re rerouted. That uh, really isn't a detail that we've kind of looked at in terms of the programming yet, but that, that would uh, be a necessity, I would think. Okay, Councillor Darling. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, yes, I too must admit I am thoroughly impressed with the plan. I was wondering how you were going to take pavement and put paving stones in and uh, and and make it as nice as you did. Uh, obviously, it's it's exceeded my expectations. One question I do have is on the lifespan of the pavers. I notice along our waterfront we've had paving stones in the walkways, and they've started to degrade and break down. I'm not sure if that's frost or I know we don't use salt along the walkway. Um, is there any kind of uh, different grade of paving stones, you know, good, better, best sort of thing? And what kind of lifespan are we looking at? Because there is a lot of paving stones. We do the project, and you don't want 10 or 15 years later to have to turn around and replace them because they broke down. I think I, I'll let uh, Lisa answer that one, but there certainly are good and bad paving stones, so that's something to consider right off the hop. So we're looking at... Uh, using, th there are all different grades, so like pedestrian, uh, vehicular traffic, emergency vehicle traffic, and there's only certain pavers that are rated for the, the higher use zones. So we have to be looking at pavers that are very durable. Um, there's also different options with finish now. So there's a different way that they make the, the surface of the paver to put a lot of fines in it so that the color lasts longer. And it's supposed to just hold better and kind of repel salt and it it all sounds very good it's a little bit new but we are looking at using those higher end materials so that we do get a longer lifespan as for the actual amount of time I'm not sure on that the the length of time that the pavers sh should last but I mean it's concrete right it it is a very durable material that it shouldn't be breaking down anytime soon Okay, thank you. That's good to know. Thank you. Okay, uh, Deputy Mayor Henderson. Uh, thank you both for a most informative uh, presentation. My only question is, I know right now, President, we have a fairly large generator that uh, works in conjunction with Victoria Hall, and I didn't see that. So can you tell me what's going to happen to that wonderful size uh, generator outside? We've been told that there's going to be uh, a new setup for the uh, for the backup power, I think. Uh, more of a permanent generation generator set, I think, that'll be uh, located elsewhere uh, around the corner, I believe. 
Could you just elaborate on that, um, Mr. Peacock? Uh, yes, I, I will, Your Worship. Um, uh, I know that the Building Department uh, and Ian Davey are looking at options right now, and the, I think there'll be a report probably coming to Council, and Ian may want to make a comment. Uh, other comments or questions? Uh, Councillor McCarthy again. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, since it was touched on in the presentation, opportunities for fundraising, and I might have to ask the chair of the committee to speak towards this, um, are there plans to get the fundraising um, opportunities started with an ad hoc committee with yourself in charge? <laughs> <laughs> if I live long enough. <laughs> yes. Uh, we have looked into that, into the uh, type of... Uh, uh, paper that we would use which would be quite different from the ones we had last time uh, they were too small they were too porous and uh, they weathered badly and uh, I have actually been looking at samples and they would be a larger paper uh, I think the 12 by 9 with a much harder finish and uh, a deeper cut uh, with the for the letters which would uh, uh, stop them eroding like they have at the moment. And yes, uh, I, th with the permission of council uh, and the approval of council, I think that uh, we could start raising money, but uh, you hate to sell something if the project doesn't go ahead. <laughs> uh, but we had a very good response last time. It was overwhelming, the number of pavers that people bought. And some people would buy a uh, hundred or f 50, a whole family of uh, people you know, they would you know pay for a thousand thousand dollars or more just for the family name to be in the square so I I, I was really amazed at the response of uh, not only uh, Coburg people but a lot of visitors uh, who had uh, family ties to Coburg were uh, very enthusiastic and we also got um, a lot of support from the service clubs and uh, some of the uh, residents in substantial amounts of money, uh, I mean like $35,000 and stuff like that. So I think uh, if the project is exciting enough and interesting enough, and which I think it is, uh, it's not a cheap project, but it's a very good project and something that we should be proud of, and uh, I think people would want to be part of that. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, doesn't stop tonight. It goes on. Okay. Uh, Councillor Sagan. Thank you so much, uh, William and Delisa. I can't believe how much work you've done considering this was Easter weekend from last Thursday's slides. You've done a tremendous amount of work and it's a beautiful um, project. And uh, just to follow up to Malcolm's question, I asked at the, one of the meetings why it wasn't called Malcolm Square after 20 years of him you know, so dedicated to this project. He kind of agreed that that would have been a good name. Um, the pavers that were sold um, in the previous fundraisers, um, you had mentioned, Lisa, that they could be salvaged and repositioned, cleaned. Can you maybe speak to that just briefly? So for the people that did don donate at one time. Yes, they, um, those are eight by eight pavers in a, like a double Holland stone. Um, so they're, I mean, they're a good paver, but they don't have a, a the higher end durable um, finish. That's actually been developed since then. It's fairly new. Um, but yes, they could, some of them, depending on the grade, they might be able to just stay exactly where they are, like the south and east side of the market building. Um, and then if not, they could just be lifted and relayed. Um, and as for, I mean, you could look at, at deepening the engraving, but I wouldn't think that it would probably be worth doing that. You'd have to take them back somewhere and re-sandblast and that would be a lot of work. But I mean, they're, you can still read them. They're, they're not bad really, but we would be looking at using a, a, a version that's going to last longer for the next round. The ones that we showed in the presentation were a 12 by 12 size. And you can get a lot of writing on those, so it kind of opens it up a bit more as well that people might be more interested in, in buying them if they can put a couple of lines on. Okay, uh, Deputy Mayor Henderson again. Um, yes, one question came to mind, and it's more of a technical question. 
Uh, regarding the Second uh, Street Fire Hall in the Market Building, um, did you know the uh, depth we would have surrounding those buildings? And the reason I'm asking because we're presently starting to restore over the next two or three years uh, Second Street Fire Hall, and, and I'm assuming perhaps next term of council could also be the Market Building. And I know sometimes I have to bring in extensive equipment to do the roof lines, uh, the gutters, and so on. I'm just wondering uh, if, would, I'm assuming that was taken into consideration. Yeah, so you're thinking the, uh, the width of the upper square all the way around. Yeah, so I think uh, we've got about 12 feet there, which should make for a reasonably good kind of working surface around that, that upper level. But... Uh, you know, if you had an idea of how much how much uh, space you needed, we could certainly look at uh, adjusting the plan. But we're fairly far along now, so it would be uh, it would be kind of a good thing to confirm definitely before we get started, or look at the sequencing of those events as well. Right? You could maybe do some of the restoration work on those critical sides before you do some of the square work. Uh, through your worship, perhaps I could ask Mr. Davey, because I know he has experience with the past uh, renovation companies that dealt with, obviously, Victoria Hall or upcoming for the Second Street Fire Hall. So perhaps that's information from a technical side you could share, because obviously I'm not familiar what that what that depth would be, but I'm sure the companies would know if they're bringing uh, a massive piece of equipment on site, they could... Uh, share that because I know we're starting the Second Street Fire Hall this year. So, Mr. Davey, if you could do that, I know it would be appreciated, I'm sure. Okay, um, other questions or comments from members of council? Uh, Councilor MacArthur, McCarthy again. Thank you, Mayor Brockenier. Um, as Malcolm uh, thanked all the participants, um, I would like to take a moment to thank the Public Art Committee uh, they uh, consisted of um, three members from the uh, main committee, but also other members that gave time and effort to shortlist uh, 20, no, sorry, 12 proposals for public art. This was way back in November. Uh, shortlisted to four, and then spent a whole day with presentations of the maquettes and um, came up with a recommendation that went through to the uh, main committee. It was a really daunting process for all of us. It was new to us, and I also want to thank CAO Peacock for the support he provided because we, at the moment, don't have a public art uh, committee. It's been retired pending the cultural master plan. So in particular, as well as the previously mentioned, I'd like to thank uh, public members of the public, David Akamba, who attended, and Sheila Stewart. Uh, they provided their background in the performing arts and the visual arts to that process. And that was an incredible process, and it was unanimous with the public art committee and uni unanimous with the Victoria Square Committee on those pillars. They're quite remarkable that uh, I am. I know they'll get built and they will add so much to the square. So thanks to those members as well. Well, Lisa and William, uh, that brings us to the end of the presentation. And uh, of course, the good news is we have a great project. Uh, the bad news is we don't have the money to complete it right away. But, uh, you know, I think that uh, having it completed to the stage that it's at, the very moment any um, provincial or federal funding becomes available, we can lay that on the table immediately and be first in on any grants that are coming forward. So again, thank you very much. It's a, it's a wonderful project. Your Worship, at this time we have delegations and we have Max LaMarchand on behalf of the area property owners and residents regarding the road allowance rail crossing, lot 23 and 25, concession A in the town of Coburg. Welcome, Max. Your Worship, Mayor Brockenier, uh, councillors, staff, and members of the public. My name is Max uh, Lamarchand, and I think this is an important issue to bring forward. I'm going to try and move quickly, and then if there's questions, um, by all means. Uh, the, uh, the issue is basically a long outstanding one. It's uh, a roadway on the west side of Coburg 
that has been progressively degraded by the railways over the last 20 some odd years and then is now being blocked completely. And uh, that roadway is, just to orientate you, um, is on the west side of town. This, this area shows the area between uh, the town of Coburg and Port Hope and the roadway is basically right in here and uh, that is the road allowance we're referring to and you get a little bit closer here and basically you can see here's Northumberland Mall there's the roadway there this is the Pebble Beach community this is the new Amherst development right here Sorry, um, the original uh, the original road allowance was laid out in 1791 by Augustus Jones. He was a surveyor for Simcoe. It's a very it's one of the earliest roads that was laid out in uh, in the establishment of the area, and you can see it here. Or maybe you can see it here if your eyesight is very good. This particular map is from an 1878 atlas, which was roughly 100 uh, 100 years after the road was initially laid out. Um, the history of the, of the, or just to go back here for a second, if you look carefully on this map, uh, down below the single track, which is the Grand Trunk, you will see uh, several houses uh, at the base of that, and you'll also see a road going further to the west, which is here, and up here this is Car Road. These roads were very significant, well-developed roads in the early times of Coburg, and these particular houses were very significant in Coburg and history uh, for a number of reasons. The actual Crown Pratt patents were transferred um, in 1798. The first uh, lot was sold to C. Shaw, and that was on the, the west side. Um, sorry, uh, that was on the west side right here. This is lot 24. And subsequently, in, in 1846, that was bought by Sidney Smith. And Sidney Smith it was a councillor in Coburg and Hamilton Township. He was also the postmaster general for uh, Canada West. Um, he was a very significant uh, person and uh, a very prominent person. And his grandfather, Elijah Smith, actually founded Port Hope and was one of the initial Empire Loyalists. So the history of, of this particular area is very significant. This picture is of um, Edwin Gullett, who is uh, one of the renowned historians of Coburg, standing on the property which subsequently became known as the Tracy Estate. That might be a lot of history for people, but the history is important because it's very important to realize that this area and these roads were established, used from the foundation of Coburg. Uh, this is the area now. Uh, this is another picture of, uh, of Edwin Goulet, and he is recounting in his history how uh, Sidney Smith was there, the Tracy family was there, uh, the uh, King uh, Henry VII of England visited in 1860, which was the first prominent visit to Canada West, uh, to, uh, Sid to uh, Sidney Smith's residence. That also might sound a little bit boring, but it is significant to our area history. And also, even going west, there was, uh, there's quite a history of different activities, including a, even a gypsy camp that was uh, located farther to the west. Um, so this particular road was there and used uh, from the earliest time of Coburg. You can see on the, uh, on the maps, this is the existing lot fabric in the New Amherst area. This is Pebble Beach right here. And if you look very closely, you can see there's a clearly defined road allowance um, in place. Uh, the railways, uh, the Grand Trunk Railway materialized in 1856, so that was basically uh, 50 years, uh, over 50, almost 60 years after the first Crown Patent land was transferred on the east side and 25 years after uh, the land on the west side. And basically, uh, the, that was the Grand Trunk. It went into 1856 
Uh, subsequently, it was, um, it was expanded in the 1890s, and then uh, the grand, uh, or the uh, CPR went in in 1911. So a long time after the, uh, the road was there. This is uh, out of the official plan of Coburg. You can see that the road here is in the official plan. Uh, it's needed to be in the official plan because you have no access out of the, the west side of Coburg without it. Uh, and there's an area below the tracks here that is uh, isolated with single access, which is a safety hazard amongst other things. Um, the long-term planning for the area, this is a recent study that was done by the county of Northumberland. And uh, basically, it just shows you the idea in the fullness of time that there's an idea that maybe a larger section of the waterfront would be accessible but it also indicates these important um, uh, road crossings. Just as a matter of, of interest, um, every road crossing between Coburg and Port Hope has been lost and blocked off. So there is no access between Coburg and Port Hope currently between the towns of Coburg and Port Hope. Uh, the Rogers Road Allowance was closed off to stop the, ho uh, the train whistle. The car road allowance has been blocked off. The theater road allowance has, has been uh, out of use for many years. The next road allowance was sold to a landowner, and the one over here was sold to the rail or transferred to the railroad after uh, the derailment uh, in uh, 2011. Most recently, what has happened is. Um, well, to go back, here's our, the illustrious, our illustrious mayor. Uh, this is uh, from the Coburg Star in, uh, in 2013. There's been, this road allowance has been recognized by many parties, including the mayor, including the town, including the planning department. It's recognized in the official plan. Uh, this was an article where people were trying to see how this could be, uh, these crossings could be reconstituted because the crossings were there, they were ripped out. You can see the crossing sign, a picture of the crossing sign in the ditch. The crossing sign is still in the ditch 25 years after they ripped it out. And this is on the CN track, on the CP track. Uh, they've just cleared the debris from removing the crossings after 20 years, about three weeks ago. Um, and as of about uh, Two weeks ago, uh, CP nailed no trespassing signs in the center of the road allowance. So this is an existing, uh, existing historic road that's relied on by the property owners to access their properties. It's been used and relied on by areas re residents uh, to, uh, since the, the beginning of Coburg. It's a, uh, a, a used area and trail by young people uh, today They've used it since I can remember when I was a high school student or young person in this area. It's still used heavily and, and more used now than ever. And uh, basically now this is being completely blocked off. Uh, this is a picture of uh, myself and our consultant team uh, that was taken in 1994. So basically that's now 23 years ago. And you can see us standing on the crossing uh, the crossings were there. There's road material in the bed. Uh, there were stop signs on this road. And basically, this is a used and established road. Since that time, shortly afterwards, they ripped the crossings out. And we have been pursuing the railroads for the last 20 years. I mean, pursuing to the best of our abilities, basically requesting and being ignored uh, for them to reinstate the railways uh, or the crossings. So basically what's occurred here is the, this particular road allowance has, been, uh, has just been uh, blocked. And uh, basically the access to the waterfront or from the waterfront has been taken. Uh, this is a picture on the road allowance, um, the lower part of it. It's uh, always been very well defined because there's a road bed in there. Um, so it's not a vague trail. It's not something that uh, is, is hard to find. It's been heavily used. Uh, you can see in this picture, if you look closely, you can see the infrastructure, the power lines running down beside the road allowance, which are still there, these power poles. 
Um, there's power poles laying in the ditch and there's power lines laying all over the place through here that have been, uh, been able to be cleared up or cleared up. Okay, Max, you've got about a minute to wrap up, Max. Okay. And uh, the, you can see here, again, the debris. So the importance of this, I, I think, for the community is, is that, one, to be aware of it, is that uh, the community is losing their access out of the west side of town. Um, the landowners um, are obviously not happy because they've lost their access to their, uh, to their uh, property. Um, the safety aspects of it, this is a picture from the train derailment uh, just slightly west of there in Port Hope. Uh, there was a train derailment uh, at General Foods within this period. Um, it's not hard to understand the consequences of these. Um, this is an article basically uh, about, one of the, about some of the landowners and their frustration with uh, dealing with the area. Um, this, of course, is uh, a very uh, you know, well-known accident that occurred. And the reason why I'm including it is, is because part of the reason for this was the corporations reducing costs of maintenance and staffing. And taking out these existing road allowances is, a, is to reduce costs. And it's just, uh, it's just that simple and it, uh, it needs to be, uh, to be addressed. So um, again, I think this is, uh, this is an issue that I know the mayor is very familiar with and I know many members of the staff are very familiar with. Um, it's come to a head right now because over the years uh, where basically the, the, the road allowance was just degraded, the property owners and the general public put up with the fact that it was being degraded, hoping that it would be improved. Now it's being completely blocked off. Obviously, property owners can't access their property, which is their right. And uh, residents and people in the area cannot traverse or get out of the area, which is uh, a safety hazard on its own. So uh, I thought it was very important to bring to uh, Council's attention. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, Max. Uh, you're right. It's uh an important part of Coburg history, uh, but uh, you know sometimes you know, th things change. As we know, we both had conversations with CNCP, so, and uh, they aren't always in control. Uh, they they get marching orders from elsewhere. So I'm just going to open up to members of council who may have. Um, I'm looking for questions of clarity here uh, from Max's presentation. Uh, Councillor Rowden, do you have a question of clarity? Yeah, just a quick question there, uh, Max. Uh, do you own property below the tracks as well? Is there anything that's developable down there? The, uh, the New Amherst properties that stand down uh, past the tracks to the waterfront, yes. Okay. Uh, any other questions for clarity? Oh, well, then, thank you very much, Max. Appreciate it. Thank you. Your Worship, at this time we have a delegation by Brenda Whitehead, representing the Coburg Legion Minor Softball Association, requesting support of the 2017 softball season and the U16 Boys Fast Pitch National Championship being held in August at Legion Fields in Coburg. Thank okay, you, welcome, Brett. Thank you, Your Worship. Your Worship, Deputy Mayor Henderson, Council, staff, media, and the general public. I don't have a slideshow. What I do have is a letter that I wrote to the mayor and the deputy mayor that I'd just like to read. And then if there's any questions, it can be answered. Uh, Coburg Legion Minor Softball Organization, CLIMZO, is committed to providing a quality sporting experience to any and all persons who love and value the game of softball. As we celebrate our 60th season, the volunteers of CLIMZO recognize that they have always partnered with the community to make sure quality programs continue. Coburg Legion Minor Softball is the longest running sports program in Coburg. It is able to remain the most affordable game in town because of the ongoing efforts of volunteers and support from local businesses and organizations who help us keep costs low for the players and their families. An entire season of softball is $100 or less. In the fall of 2016, we were approached to host the 2017 U16 Boys Fast Pitch National Championship at Legion Fields in Coburg. We agreed that this was a great opportunity to show off our game, our facilities, and our 60 years of sporting excellence. Traditionally, these tournaments are awarded 24 months in advance. 
Klimzo was given nine months to deliver after a Western community turned the event back to Softball Canada. So somebody else had been awarded the games and uh, Softball Canada came to us because of our tremendous facilities. The town of Coburg is becoming known for its sport tourism events and in 2017 Haver will be hosting the men's tankard and the women's Scots tournaments of hearts, the curling that happened, the RBC Cup hockey which is coming in another month or so, the 55 plus senior winter games, all of which this council financially supported. Now this national championship that will add to promoting Coburg as a community uh, that recognizes the value of sport. In fact, Klimzo is actually hosting two other tournaments for U16 boys this year. There's an invitational on uh, May 27th, and the Provincial Elimination Tournament, which is actually the qualifier for the Nationals, is coming on July 7th and 8th. The Coburg Legion Bantam Dodgers have an opportunity to play at the highest level possible on their own turf, which is an experience of a lifetime. The economic impacts of hosting sport tourism events is not an unknown concept, especially to this community. Every visit comes with the benefit of dollars being spent during the event, with the further economic spin-off of those who visit the community coming back to enjoy our many attractions, when the focus in this case is not on playing ball. We will be holding an event of this nature for this age group three times in 2017. Up to 48 teams, including their players and coaches, officials, families and fans, could be coming and going through Legion Fields over these three tournaments. The purpose of this correspondence is to make a direct request to Council for financial support of the national event only. Given the larger impact of an event like this, the larger showcase requirements, overall costs associated with the event, uh, the organization is required to offset costs rather than incur them in conjunction, conjunction with the provincial organization. So when we run the elimination tournament, we do that in cooperation with OASA and um, we cover all the costs together so there's nobody putting out any extra um, monies or expenses. Um, in this case, the expenses of the tournament are attached for your information and understanding. So there is an expense list that was included. Uh, our sponsorship goal at this time is $25,000 of cash and in-kind contributions, which will help offset the tournament costs of just over 33000 The remainder will be made up through gate, fundraisers, advertising sales. With the recent announcement by the town that they would not be extending the canteen operations contract for this year, we may have to revisit the $25,000 goal to ensure that we can continue to meet 2017 budgets. We recognize that there is a community grants process for requests such as this. However, we were awarded the tournament after that deadline for 2017, and we appreciate the opportunity to make this request. So, Klimzo would like to request a waiving of fees for the facilities as outlined in the schedule report that was provided by the staff, uh, which is $3,200, as well as any additional understandable facility fees that may be incurred, like picnic table moving at 250 per table, setup of snow fencing to secure the park, safe parking of golf carts when they're not in use to transport umpires to the CCC and stuff, to a maximum of $4,000 in kind. A cash contribution of $6,000 to be used to boost the marketing and signage, offset costs for the opening ceremony, welcome reception, hospitality, and volunteer uniforms. Total budgeted for these items is $10,000.50. Town of Coburg swag to create team welcome packages, so bags or pins, tourist information, that kind of thing, uh, for distribution to coaches upon arrival and uh, the staff that are assigned assistance and to assign staff to help in building them. We create one info pack per team as opposed to one per player. We also anticipate needing a small army to do on-site jo on jobs like scorekeeping, gate admissions, security. Uh, we are also on the lookout for anyone who would be interested in helping with marketing, sponsorship, and pre-tournament organizing. We would like to request that the Town of Coburg assist with recruitment through their websites, communication channels, and volunteer connections. Uh, provision of these requests would ensure that the Town of Coburg is recognized as a primary sponsor and the TAU logo will be included on all event paraphernalia. I did notice in reviewing the minutes that um, the recommended action indicated referral to the Parks and Rec Advisory Committee and staff for recommendations and report. I would like to ask if possible to request a date that we can expect a response to that as everything is on a very tight timeline so we need to know uh, what's happening in a as short a time as possible. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, Brenda. Uh, thank you for speaking on behalf of Corporate Legion Minor Softball.
and uh, taking on this tremendous challenge. So I'm going to open up to members of council who may have some further questions for you. And I'll start with uh, Deputy Mayor Henderson. Uh, thank you, Worship, and thanks, Brenda, for your presentation. The only question I have, do you have a, a date in mind? Because I, I believe this tournament happens in August. We know there has to be a lot of pre-planning before August, but do you have sort of a, a drop-dead date you'd like to hear back from us in terms of uh, your request or report? April 18th. <laughs> I'm kidding, John. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry. That's tomorrow, John. I'm just kidding. I'm um, sorry, Deputy Mayor. Um, because we have a, such a lucrative goal for sponsorship and in-kind contributions, um, we don't want to go out and blanket the town and ask everybody for tremendous amounts. We want to be able to build on a gradual. So we have had very in-depth conversations with Coburg Legion. Um, we've started conversations with the Lions Club and some of the other larger community groups. Um, but really we're hoping that the town will be the, you know, the primary sponsor, give us the jump that we would want. Um, so I don't know, you know, um, probably within the next 30 days would be ideal if there's a Parks and Rec Advisory Committee meeting before then. Councillor McCarthy. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Brenda. No stress, eh? None. <laughs> None. <laughs> Thanks for having a sense of humor. Um, because I just came to the Ontario Winter Games and, and that, that process, I just would like some perspective on this initiative. You obviously, your organization has experience doing tournaments, but in terms of scale, is this a much, much bigger event and more and more resources, or is this something manageable other than the requests you've made with your current group of volunteers? Thank you, um, through your worship. The, um, this event has actually created its own steering committee, no different than the um, the winter senior games and um, the RBC Cup and such. So we do have representatives from the town. We do have representatives from the sport council. Um, we have members of our own CLIMSO executive, as well as some of the 60-year alumni in the community that are joining together for this. We are tournament experts, according to Softball Canada. The difference is a provincial tournament is traditionally two days with eight teams, uh, where the national tournament is five days with 16 teams, up to 16 teams. Doesn't mean we'll get 16. Depends on who qualifies and, and what their outcomes are. So really for us, it's the scope as well. So we have to be able to present it, you know, live streaming on Kojiko, everything's online and animated. You know, it is a much larger scale than just having, you know, eight teams come to the Legion Fields and run a tournament. Okay, uh, Deputy Mayor Henderson, you're next, and then back to, then over to uh, Councillor Darling, and then back to Councillor McCarthy. And through your worship, and again, thank you. Um, I know that you certainly couldn't get this into our organizational municipal uh, uh, during budget time, just not possible. But would you be open to at least, uh, if we ask you to complete what we have now, or uh, uh, the community grant application that way we get a sense and it comes to the table what we could be looking at I know we find it very helpful uh, right now I have Councillor Segan on the committee I have Councillor McCarthy I have Mr. Davey I have our CAO Stephen Peacock and we just find it very helpful if we have that information to help us make a decision that may come back with that report so would you be open to filling in at least the application we have now um, on file can I just ask a question through uh, your worship? Um, is there information that's not included in this letter that would be part of that application process? And yes. is, it, is it something that we could, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, you know, sort of speed through to make sure that we just have the questions answered that are part of the, communication, the community grant process? Well, it be filled out, I think, fairly quickly if you have all the uh, parts, uh, which appears you do. It's just putting it down verbatim so we have some further information. Okay, and sorry, uh, through your worship, how much time will that delay us getting an answer? If I do it by Friday, you know, like hypothetically, because that's just adding another step to the process, right? So when is the next Parks and Rec Advisory Committee meeting? Or would it go through community grants, then Parks and Rec, then staff, then council? Sorry, no, I'm just asking process questions. No, my thought would just be at this point, if you had it, then uh, we could certainly give it to uh, Councillor Darling 
because obviously this is going back for a report and he could have that with him. It just helps uh, to see the overview. Okay. And, and sorry, uh, through your worship, where would we get that application? Okay. You, okay. you just come into the main office? The administration or can office it be emailed? Yes. Okay. I'll email Mr. Larmer. Okay. Uh, Councilor Darney, you are next. Uh, yes, thank you, Your Worship. Um, just to clarify, uh, the recommendation will be that it does not go to Parks and Recs, as it is a, uh, a staff process for uh, grants. So it, it's, the process will be speeded up a little bit. We won't have to wait for Parks and Rec because they do not okay. comment on this. That was just a, a little misprint in the agenda. Okay. Um, my question, I have a, a couple here. Now, you're expecting to run this event, and uh, are you expecting to run it at a profit or use it as a fundraising event, or is it just a break even? Ideally, we want to break even. We don't want Coburg Legion Minor Softball to incur any additional costs for bringing the tournament to town. Um, other communities have had great success in using it as a fundraiser um, that they can redirect it back into our not-for-profit sport organization so we can continue to keep the fees low and affordable for families as everybody else's costs continue to go up. Okay, and secondly, the softball candy had some expenses listed for softball candy regarding umpires, etc. Does softball candy contribute anything towards it? Uh, through the mayor, no. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> That's, those are the additional costs compared to a provincial tournament where everybody helps to incur those costs through their membership in the provincial organization. Okay, thank you. Okay, Brenda, um, since you are the Coburg Legion Minor Softball Association, are you getting any funding from the Legion, the local Legion? We, uh, sorry, um, we have uh, completed an application process with them. Their finance committee was meeting just Thursday night, and I haven't got a response back from President John yet. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McCarthy, you are up next, and then Councillor Rowden after, and then Councillor Sagan after that. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just for the clarification, uh, you called it a steering committee, but I'm figuring it's a games organizing committee on the model of winter games. And uh, you've alluded to people who have had experience with that. Would that include uh, Paul Todd and Eugene, or Eugene Todd and Paul Allen? <laughs> And uh, your organization? Right. We're actually uh, in the model of the Softball Canada Organizing Committee. So one of the things that's very different, and uh, Brian can allude to this, is the support that Softball Canada gives to us as an organizing committee. So they give us a book of step-by-step. -step. They assign us a right. mentor. We have somebody there with us, so we can't make any mistakes as we're planning and doing the things. Um, Paul Allen does sit on the committee as a representative of the Sports Council and uh, his grandson plays on the team that's competing. So he's uh, there with us and very actively involved, along with Ashley Haynes, uh, Jason Johns, uh, Councillor Darling, Heather Grundy, uh, and then four or five of us from our organization. Uh, well, just to um, allay your concern about another application, it's just those numbers that if you could lay them out and show how you're going to break even plus your financial history would help us a lot in determining uh, what action to take. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Rodden, you were next. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. And uh, Brenda, it looks like it's going to be a good-sized tournament. Uh, I was just thinking that... Uh, the economic spin out is the benefactors here are going to be uh, motels and restaurants in the area. Have you a fundraising committee to get some of the funds that you may need uh, that's over and above what could be granted? Right. Uh, through you, uh, Your Worship, uh, we have within our committee created a subcommittee responsible for fundraising and sponsorship. As chair, I take the lead in doing that to make sure that we try to stay on financial track at all times. And then we do have... Uh, you know, some of our softball gurus like you were Timlin and, um, you know, those older guys who are well connected in the game uh, being part of that publicity and fundraising stuff. Councillor Sagan. Thank you, Brenda. Obviously, softball group has a very dedicated and um, organized person at the helm. So thank you for that. My question is... Um, the national uh, tournament for the last three years, do you have any stats on economic impact and whether or not those, I mean, you got this late in the game, but um, this is this is a question to know how many people we can, uh, you can expect to bring to Coburg. You, had, you mentioned um, how many teams? Uh, it, 
uh, for this tournament specifically, um, it's no more than 16 teams. Okay. Each team has a minimum of 12 players, usually 14, plus a coaching staff of five. And then everybody's mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle, cousin, neighbor. Yeah. And then the officials too, because the officials and um, scorekeepers and stuff come from all across Canada. Um, they come, the umpires aren't actually paid a per diem or a, a game. They're given a per diem and come as volunteers uh, for the extra experience to add to their own qualification cards and stuff. So they're trying to save us even more cost by us not having to pay for umpires. You mentioned uh, gate receipts of some kind. I guess what I'm trying to say is other than the grandpas and the grandmas and the, the mamas and the dads and the kids and the coaches, uh, who else comes to watch these, like other teams, other communities that have hosted this tournament na on a national scale? Um, is it something that um, is well known and, and uh, do we, can we expect, you know, crowds or just the immediate uh, folks that are involved with the teams? Uh, my understanding from the... Um Bantam tournament that was held in uh, Owen Sound last year here in Ontario um, uh, and Paul Allen could tell you exactly because he was there and experienced it. Um, there were thousands of people a day that come to watch the game because it is a hometown game. It's a game that's been played especially in small parts of Ontario for, well we've been doing it for 60 years so generation upon generation continues. It's the game you play for life. It's not Blue Jays baseball, it's fast pitch softball, right? So if I want to go play ball now as an adult, I'm still playing softball. So it's something that everybody is attracted to always. Okay. So, uh, I think we've got all the uh, questions that we needed to uh, ask, Brenda. Okay. Thank you again for taking this on. Five weeks you've got, I mean, it's, you're right, it's a very, very tight timeline. Yeah. And I appreciate uh, the need for a speedy answer. So I'm sure Councillor Darling will do his best to to uh, work that through for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, okay Your Worship, at this time, uh, the action recommended here is that Council refer to the matter to staff uh, for a report. Discussion? All in favor? It's carried. Your Worship, we now have the Coordinator Services reports, and the first being under General Government Services. So I'm going to pass the chair over to you, uh, Deputy Mayor Henderson. Thank you, Worship. There's a memo from the Treasurer, Director of Corporate Services regarding the 2016 Council and Local Board Renumeration and Expense Reports. Uh, the Act recommended that Council receive the report for information purposes. Uh, this is something we do uh, on an annual basis. I believe the report is quite clear. And I'm pleased to say that uh, we are following all the rules and procedures um, that council has to abide by. And uh, that applies to everyone in council, including the mayor. So I'll answer any questions if there are any. Otherwise, uh, I believe the report speaks for itself. Seeing none, I'll call a vote. All those in favor? Carried. Against? Thank you. Uh, Councillor Darling, please take the chair for Parks and Recreation. Thank you, Worship. Um, I have a memo here from the Marina Manager regarding the barrier-free washroom renovation project at the Coburg Marina. Um, the action recommended is that, uh, hold on, I just lost it here, that Council authorize up to $65,054 as a capital expenditure for the construction of two barrier-free washrooms to be located at the Coburg Marina Administration Building, including relocation of an existing fish cleaning station. And further, that the project will be funded from the 2017 capital budget and the Federal Enabling Accessibility Fund Community Accessibility Stream Grant. Now, this, uh, this project had started uh, with the 2016 budget. We'd set money aside for it. Um, through our Northern Industrial Park, we were going to use that money, and then we had applied for funding from the government, and they came through with 65% uh, of the funding, so it uh, reduces our cost by that amount. That's all I have at this time. Uh, Deputy Mayor Henderson? Uh, just two questions made through you, uh, Councillor Darling. Um, 
I apologize I didn't get them to you earlier. Um, my two questions are, in this setup, I couldn't tell from the uh, diagram, I apologize, but do we have a water fill-up station anywhere near or around this washroom, or was there any consideration given for an adult change table, knowing that we do have some adults with mobility issues, and I, I apologize, I couldn't tell from the diagram, so they could be there, uh, just I couldn't tell. Um, as for the water fill station, I'm not quite sure. Are you mean just for uh, drinking bottles and whatnot? Yeah, I'm just thinking like since it, it, it's going to be used for general public, and if we're going to that expense for both uh, barrier-free washrooms, I th I didn't know yeah. if on the outside there was consideration given for that, so people as they're passing by. Uh, it would serve that purpose as well because I know the one at the CCC is well used, um, but I don't. I couldn't tell from the diagrams if that was part and parcel or if that would. If it was considered that being an additional amount. Um, I couldn't tell. Okay. Well, to be honest with you, I don't know. I could check with uh, Director Hustwick and see if he is familiar with that. If we have it, but as for the adult change table, that is all part and parcel now of the AODA. So um, part of the renovation changes that we did were to incorporate that. We had to redesign the building a little bit to make sure that that did go in. Um, and I'll just check with Director Hustwick if he's familiar with the uh, water fill station. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, to the Deputy Mayor, um, I don't believe water fill was incorporated in, in this specific project, but we can certainly take a lo another look at it. We certainly have the funds available uh, to make an amendment like that. Um, and uh, as the Chair mentioned, the uh, adult change station is a requirement uh, for the accessibility and that's actually the reason one of the foot washing stations was moved to the exterior was to make room uh, for the change station so uh, both uh, uh, washrooms are uh, unis uh, multi-sex um, uh, they can be used by by either so there's only one change station in, in one of the washrooms and one foot station was moved outside which actually is probably not a bad idea anyways because if people are coming from the beach they can wash their feet uh, off uh, before dressing, getting in vehicles and things like that. Thank you, Director Hustwick. Any further questions? All in favor of the motion? And uh, opposed? Carried. Okay, Councilor Rowden, you have several items under public services, so uh, I pass the chair to you. Thank you, Your Worship. And uh, the first item is a memo from the Director of Public Works regarding the approval of transit bus number 905 and 906 for refurbishment. And uh, the action recommended that council approve the quotation of $17,345.54 plus HST submitted by Winslow Germany Motors Limited for the supply and repair work of a new transmission for the bus 906 uh, be accepted and that Century Transportation to be funded from the equipment replacement reserve and further that council approve the quotation of $9,439.40 plus HST submitted by Century Transportation to rebuild the motor in bus number 905, the wheels bus, to be refunded from the uh, equipment replacement reserve. And your worship, uh, these buses uh, certainly get a lot of miles on them and uh, they are getting older and uh, they do break down and uh, this one uh, now we've had a school bus on, I think, for approximately two to three weeks, and certain of uh, people aren't complaining too much, but I noticed that uh, it's not uh, the same as having the town bus on. So we certainly got to go ahead with this, there's no doubt. If there's any questions uh, in regards to this, we'll refer to the director likely. Uh, Your Worship. Uh, not a question, um, Mr. Chair, just a comment because I was around when we purchased these buses. When we purchased these buses, we purchased them knowing that they had a 15-year life expectancy. And the only way you can get a 15-year life expectancy out of the bus is to buy a bus with a heavy-duty frame. And when you do that, you know that halfway through the, life, the lifespan of that bus, you're going to have to replace both the motor and the transmission. But if, you know, for about forty to $50,000, that's a very, very cheap investment in terms of getting a 15-year uh, life out of a bus. So I think, you know, uh, there's no, to me, there's no surprises here. And I think it's very important that we keep our fleet 
up and running and supporting the services that we have committed to for accessibility and that's the reason why we, we should even though the 905 bus is an older bus it, we, it you know it continues to be very serviceable serviceable for accessibility and so once again you know it's going to be money well spent because then as you said earlier we're not going to have to use school buses to back up our regular transit route and it's so important for the people who rely on the bus that need uh, accessible services so so the uh, as I said this was this money that we're asking to be spent was in the plan when we bought the buses uh, thank you worship for that and uh, and also we do have new buses ordered but again there's a quite a long wait to get those there's no doubt that they uh, will be in this uh, following fall sometime and uh, the accessibility bus and the new bus so anyways any other questions uh, deputy mayor Henderson uh, just a question of clarity mr. chair and I do want to thank Director uh, Thrasher for answering my many questions. He, he was uh, spot on, so I appreciate all those answers. The only one I want clarification on, I, I know in addition to this cost on the bus for 906, it appears we also have a $1,250 labor charge, which is my understanding is above the 17000 And if that's correct, Director Thrasher, I just want to know, should we put that total in with this total now and have uh, our council round make an amendment i'm just looking for direction from you to make sure we got all the costs i'm not against the recommendation i just want to make sure we got all the costs uh, through mr chairman to uh, deputy mayor yes that uh, <clears throat> 1250 dollars is an additional cost on top of the purchase price of the transmission and, and um, the reason that we recommend that we give the actual repair work to Century is because the bus is there now to take it anywhere else would re require uh, uh, towing which would result in, an, uh, in another fee so yes you're, you're right that that 1250 should be added to the, the total so Councilor Round can I ask you just to add that amount in and then uh, I'm fully supportive for all the reasons uh, elicited uh, and stated by the mayor because obviously we need all this thanks Okay, uh, Deputy Mayor. So we'll add the twelve fifty to the seventeen hundred and or seventeen thousand three hundred forty-five dollars and forty-five fifty-four cents. Just, 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 just a point of order, uh, of Chair Rowdy. So you should you should deal with the amendment first. So there's a request okay. for an amendment. Deal with okay. that, and then. Okay. Yeah. Add we ask for a motion then for the amendment of the twelve hundred and fifty dollars over and above for the uh, bus company. Century uh, transfer, transportation to uh, to uh, do the work in Portal. Can I all in favor of that? Carried. And then the original uh, recommendation. Then uh, I'll ask for the vote on that. If there's any other questions first? Seeing none, can I have a all in favor? Carried. Uh, number two is a memo from the Director of Public Works regarding the awarding of the Hardin Street Bridge Rehabilitation Tender Contract Number CO1703. And the action recommended that Council approve the low bid of $324,800. Oh, just ran out of battery here. And that uh, council approved the low bid of three hundred twenty-four thousand eight hundred thirty-six dollars and sixty-five cents plus HST, as submitted by the Baltimore Development Services Limited for the rehabilitation of the Harden Street Bridge Project Coburg, and further that council approve forty-nine thousand six hundred dollars from the James Street East two thousand seventeen Public Works capital budget be reallocated to the Harden Street Bridge Project and that $10,475.94 be debentured to provide additional funding for the project. And further, that the Director of Public Works be authorized to amend the scope of work to reduce costs, if feasible, as permitted under Section 12 of the, form of the tender document. And if there's any questions, uh, we'll ask the Deputy Director to explain his situation on this. Uh, Councillor Darling. 
Yes, I was just wondering under uh, Section 12, form to uh, reduce costs, what kind of uh, scope would we be looking at? Just kind of an example of that. Director Thrasher? Uh, <coughs> through that you, one? Through, yes, through you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, the, uh, the scope of work includes a number of items. So we could, we could reduce one. We could, for example, we could decide not to remove the, the railings that are along the top that we're recommending have new galvanizing recoding done. That's an example of something we could drop off if we feel we can't, um, we can't follow through with the recommendation that I'm. We, our recommendation is to do all of the work. Uh, they're, they're all required uh, items, and they'll all go toward extending the life of the structure. But that's an example of something we could remove from the scope if we had to. Okay, thank you. That's just what I was looking for. Any other questions? Uh, Mayor Buckner? No, I would just, uh, just to follow up to that, I, uh, uh, Chair Rowden, I would say that, uh, you, you know, I, even though there are several components to the overall job completion, um, I wouldn't recommending, I would, certainly wouldn't recommend taking out any component that would have to go back and shut the roadway down again. I think one closure is enough because it's a fairly heavily used uh, roadway with a bridge on it. So I would encourage you, uh, Director Thrasher, to, to do everything all at once. Any other questions? All in favor of the motion? Carried. Okay, Councillor McCarthy, you have, uh, I think, two items on that you now have the chair. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the first item is, as I pull it up, regarding, um, sorry, I've got two files open. So the first item, is, I'll put the recommendation on the floor first and then I will uh, speak to it. And it's recommendation that the request of the Architectural Conservancy of Ontario, Coburg and East Northumberland for an exemption to sign bylaw 008-2009 as amended to erect approximately 200 uh, line son, signs, lawn signs for a duration of 15 weeks be approved subject to finalization of details by building department staff and the issuance of a sign permit. Uh, this request comes uh, through to council because uh, what is required for this uh, Coburg 2017 one, Canada 115 project uh, goes beyond the scope of our bylaw and uh, this is in fact a community event that's going to um, provide for the community uh, signs in front of locations of homes that will say we were, we were here in 1867 uh, which is a tremendous opportunity to share our heritage with uh, those who are willing to go out and about and see the signs. The QR code will be on this sign which will allow people to uh, use their mobile phones to get specific information uh, through our GIS uh, system about that property so it's a value added experience it's, um, both uh, of our heritage and it's like a guided walking tour if people have the right um, equipment. Um, there, so um, I, I hope Council supports this uh, it's it's wonderful to see such a creative project come to fruition that oh it's been about a year and a half in the making are there any questions I'll call the question all in favor any opposed declined or uh, there's no one opposed so the motion passes the next item is regarding um, an amendment to bylaw 04 or 2015 delegate to amend the delegations of powers and duties regarding noise exemptions. I'll place the motion on the floor, the recommendation I should say. The council authorized preparation of a bylaw to amend bylaw number 040. 2015, a bylaw to establish a delegation of powers and duties by municipal staff in the town of Coburg for the purpose of temporarily closing highways, to issue special permits, and to add the addition of granting specific event noise e event exemptions for the town of Coburg. 
Um, just as background, the bylaw review committee met working group uh, met with the staff involved with uh, making the decisions regarding the noise bylaw and special events and are presenting this as an opportunity to streamline uh, the the work of the working group of staff and also the necessity to come to council for an exemption. Are there any questions? Councillor Darling. Yes, more of a comment in the fact that I don't think the people are aware. Uh, Director Hustwick uh, developed a spreadsheet recently in regard to the number of events. And uh, just for this year, there's already 145 events that the town is looking after through their uh, tourism or through the community events. So for these, some of these events, it's a case of cutting, shutting a road down for a couple hours or one. Well, each time this happens, it has to come back to council for an amendment to the bylaw, which is really, really, really a, a misuse of our time in that it's such a minor event. So I think this is a very important uh, addition to our bylaws. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Darling. And just to comment that um, delegation of authority has been in place for a while for parts of it. Now the noise exemption is being added for events that occur regularly. However, if something is a new event, uh, the policy states that it has to come to council. If it becomes a recurring event, then the delegation of powers would take in place. But you're right, and I'm amazed since I've changed portfolios. I had no idea that that's a significant increase in events even from last year. Councillor Seguin. Yeah. Did you have a question? No. Nope. All right. I thought I saw a hand. Nope. Any other questions? I'll put the I'll put the vote. All those in favor? None opposed. It carries. Okay. Moving on to planning and development services. Uh, Councillor Burkett, please take the chair. Thank you, Your Worship. First item tonight is a memo from the Director of Planning and Development regarding a request for an exemption to part lot control Van Dyke Development Group blocks 89, 91, and 92 plan 39M-876 Wilkins Gate Coburg West Park Village Phase 4D. The action recommended that Council authorize preparation of a bylaw be prepared which exempts blocks 89, 91, and 92 plan 39M-876-694 to 746 Wilkins Gate in the West Park Village Coburg Phase 4D subdivision from the part lot control provisions of the Planning Act RSO 1990 CP 13 as amended. And I just ask uh, Director Mulash to speak to this briefly. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. This is a uh, common procedure, the exemptions to uh, part lot control, uh, particularly for West Park Village and New Amherst. Uh, Van Dyke uh, Developments are currently uh, constructing 23 townhouse units on the east side of uh, Wilkins Gate Extension and they are uh, very close to um, framing and, and closing on those lots. So. Uh, they do need the individual lots uh, to be um, prepared and, uh, and able to be registered for sale. So this is, again, a common procedure. Uh, it's a bylaw to allow that to happen. Thank you. Any questions from Council? Seeing none. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. The second item I have is a memo from the Director of Planning and Development regarding an application for site plan approval, development agreement, Naren Holdings, Inc., 436 King Street East, Coburg. Action recommended that Council authorize preparation of bylaws authorizing the Mayor and Municipal Clerk to execute a development agreement with Naren Holdings, Inc., and Lakefront Utilities Services, Inc., for a new commercial development at four six, or 436 King Street East, and further that holding H symbol from the property known as 436 King Street East Coburg be removed. And I believe uh, 
Director McGlashan will speak to this. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before you, uh, there's a report from myself uh, regarding this application for site plan approval. Uh, the development uh, consists of a new 334 square meter uh, commercial dentist's office and clinic at 436 uh, King Street East. And uh, what is typical uh, in terms of uh, presentation purposes, I do uh, ask that the uh, applicant uh, say a few words about the uh, proposal followed by a summary uh, by myself. And I understand that uh, Dr. Dave uh, Narine and the architect Bruce McNeil are uh, here this evening and uh, may wish to uh, say a few words to you first. Good evening. Um, I guess maybe a little bit of background. Uh, um, I have a practice that's uh, currently located at um, 17... Oh. 17 Queen Street, is that better? Um, and the practice has been located there since the early 70s and has consistently grown uh, since that time. And I think um, part of the issues that have developed with the practice since the early 70s is that um, it was never really conceived to, uh, to both handle the, the f traffic flow of... Um, or the sorry the, the the parking requirements and also the development in the equipment that's changed as the profession has changed and gradually in time the um, the shortcomings of the building that I'm currently at has uh, has really surfaced so I've been looking um, I would say in the over the past uh, five or six years for an opportunity to move out of the, out of that location into a location that's in the east end near the practice that will provide me f with a larger uh, space that has a um, access for a good percentage of my uh, patient base which is I would say maybe 20 or 30 percent of them are um, between the ages of say 55 and 75 and the current location that I'm at has uh, uh, it's located on the second floor, so access is, is limited, and I've lost, I would say, a uh, considerable amount of patients and long-standing patients to other practices and um, other areas that uh, can accommodate them. So from the one perspective, that was a really um, a motivating factor to move out of my current site. So this property became available, and I did some of the early... Uh, sort of research with it and I found that it would work quite well for the needs that I had and also to it it afforded me enough space that I could both have a, a facility and also have parking while not using the whole whole lot I can have some greenery there I could have a, a space that was uh, appealing uh, and uh, like for example we uh, sort of uh, developed a little space in front of the building that is a patio for the patients and uh, things like that. So it, it didn't just uh, afford only enough land that I had to put a practice on and a, on a parking lot on. So it was sort of an ideal situation for me. Uh, timing was also very good, which is also always important. Uh, so, Council, uh, I will certainly um, move forward with my presentation, and then we may have questions uh, afterwards. Um, uh, in addition to uh, what Dr. Narain has, uh, has indicated, uh, the site um, is uh, fairly fairly small, but it is a nice compact uh, development. Uh, the proposed um, dental office occupies about 2,000 square feet of building area. Uh, the actual area over two floors is about 3,400 square feet with, a, uh, with an upper um, office uh, and storage area. Uh, Dr. Narayan has indicated a front uh, patio area and a directly accessible sidewalk system out to the uh, municipal sidewalk, uh, as well as uh, barrier-free parking and uh, easy access to the, uh, to the front door. Uh, the rear of the property will uh, consist of some tree protection measures. There are some existing uh, butternut trees along the rear of the property and other vegetation. Along this area will be a, uh, an infiltration uh, gallery and in what's called a low impact development uh, type of stormwater 
uh, management and, and detention. And um, the, uh, the grading of the site, there is a, some um, creative uh, grading uh, taking place on this particular property, um, given that the church uh, to the uh, east uh, almost surrounds the property on uh, at least uh, two or three of the sides of this property. And uh, there were some challenges trying to obtain positive drainage flow around the site to, uh, to a catch basin along the front of the property. Uh, so there certainly um, uh, may be some remedial work um, required along the church property, but that's something uh, that we can work with uh, together in collaboration with the church. Uh, in total, a uh, total of 17 parking spaces uh, are proposed under the, uh, the site plan, uh, as I mentioned, including the, uh, the single barrier free. Uh, the uh, cost of the construction project is approximately uh, 600, uh, a little over $600,000 and uh, there will be municipal tree levies and cash in lieu of park land provided to the town in the amount of uh, just under $1,200 for the tree levy and uh, $3,600 for uh, the cash in lieu of park, park land. So in summary, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the proposal uh, meets all of the applicable uh, municipal standards and guidelines and um, we've certainly move it forward to a bylaw for approval. Certainly wish to uh, answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Director Murgulashen. Uh, Councillor Darling? Yes, uh, just for Dr. Durang, is this a standalone dentist's office or will there be multiple dentists working in it? Uh, no, it's a standalone office. It is, eh? no. okay, thank you. Any other questions from members of council? Seeing none. I'm going to call for the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next item on my agenda tonight is a memo from the Secretary Coburg Heritage Advisory Committee regarding a heritage permit application to remove and replace exterior siding and windows on property located at 18 King Street East, Coburg. The action recommended that council endorse the recommendation of the Heritage, Coburg Heritage Advisory Committee and grant a heritage permit number HP-2017-007 to remove the insole brick cladding to re remove frame and cover the two smallest windows to remove and replace the two large windows with new vinyl windows of the same dimensions and, ins and to install a vinyl vertical board and batten style cladding on the fascia of the property located at 18 King Street East, Coburg subject to finalization of details by planning staff. And I would asked uh, Allison to speak to this. She's here tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The heritage permit in question is for 18 King Street East and was uh, submitted by Mr. Lawrence White uh, just recently on Monday, April the 3rd. I met with him at his property on that date. Uh, he's not a local building owner and he was in town that day and wanted to discuss some uh, required or needed improvements to his building. There was a Coburg Heritage Committee meeting scheduled for Wednesday the 5th, which was only two days later. And uh, as we recognized that this was an opportunity to facilitate uh, improvement to a downtown building and uh, also because Mr. White intends to undertake the improvements that we're discussing today at the same time as some roof work being done on another building he owns uh, the application was expedited and I brought a verbal report to the Heritage Committee on that date so that's why I'm here before you and there's no uh, written report accompanying this application uh, given the quick timeline um, that's how we decided to proceed with this this particular building was uh, constructed sometime in the early 1900s. It's a wood frame building. It's very narrow infill construction um, that is located where there was a former alleyway uh, that historically serviced the Albion Hotel, which is the white brick building uh, just next door. <coughs> 
Currently at this location, uh, Ontario Vapes is a commercial tenant located at street level. And the second and third stories are currently vacant. And it's my understanding that there would be significant work required to bring them up to code for residential or other use. And that's not being contemplated at this time. The scope of work being proposed at this time by Mr. White includes recladding and new windows. Specifically, there's an insel brick cladding on the building. Uh, if you're familiar with it or there's some photographs attached to the motion from the Heritage Committee, it's in very bad condition. Um, as are the, the wood windows that are currently facing King Street. In that location, there are four windows uh, and they're all in, in very, very bad condition. The proposal is to remove the insel brick frame in the two smaller windows, one of which opens into an attic uh, above the third story and the other one opens into a stairwell, uh, to install new vinyl siding in a vertical board and batten style in a light color uh, with a drip ledge partway up uh, along the facade and to replace the two larger windows with windows of the same size but um, of aluminum material, white aluminum. There's also a possibility at this time to consider realigning the two larger windows, both vertically and horizontally, to match the fenestration or the window um, pattern of the King Street buildings on either side of the subject property. That's currently an ongoing discussion between staff, the building owner, and the contractor um, to see if it's feasible with the interior layout of where those windows are located relative to the floors and ceilings, um, and also the added cost that there would be to uh, undertaking that work at the same time. Now, generally, vinyl cladding and aluminum windows are not encouraged uh, or permitted on buildings in Coburg's Heritage Conservation Districts. Uh, most of the cladding and windows policies uh, in our Commercial Core Heritage Conservation District plan uh, and also the guidelines in that plan as well are focused on maintaining historic building fabric. Our Commercial Core Heritage District plan does, however, recognize that there are some existing commercial buildings within the heritage conservation that are not of historic materials or design. Where it's not possible to ensure compatibility uh, in material, or sorry, where it's not possible to conserve the historic building fabric or where there is none present, the goal with the guidelines and policies in the district plan is to ensure compatibility uh, with any new materials and also in the size and proportion and appearance of any alterations that are, that are contemplated. The plan does provide guidelines for the exterior cladding of new infill construction, which specifically discourage the use of synthetic materials, including vinyl. In the case of new infill construction in the Heritage District, the use of these materials is to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. In the case of 18 King Street East, this is not new infill development. This is an existing building that is not currently making a positive contribution to the Commercial Core Heritage Conservation District or the streetscape of King Street East. It is a building in serious need of uh, improvement. Incidentally, there's a similar building uh, across the street, uh, similar in terms of form. It's an infill development that I believe is also a former alleyway. Um, it's currently the location of Bling on King. It's a narrow vertical building that has what I believe is a metal or aluminum uh, vertical board and batten cl uh, style cladding. So it's, uh, there is a similar cladding located nearby to this particular building. 18 King Street East being a wood frame building with uh, unusual narrow dimensions, the options for cladding are limited. Uh, brick, for example, would not be a feasible option. Uh, and the proposal before you uh, for a heritage permit represents what uh, I consider to be an overall improvement to the building and does not include the removal of any historic building fabric. And as such, the Coburg Heritage Advisory Committee has recommended granting the heritage permit subject to the finalization of details by staff, including the feasibility of realigning the windows. And in the absence of any written report, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about this. Thank you, Allison. Uh, Councillor Garling. Um, yes, Ellis, I'm just wondering on this property of uh, if he took advantage of a CIP program or if it would even apply to this type of repair. 
That's an excellent question. Our uh, first intake for CIP applications just closed Thursday afternoon. Um, an application was submitted uh, by this gentleman and um, that will be considered separately from the heritage permit. Um, but we're gathering some information about the cost of the realignment of the windows, for example, to consider through that other review. Um, this was a building that, uh, as you know, likely, uh, does need some improvement and it was our targeted mail out to the property owners in the eligible area that caught his attention and caused him to contact our department to specifically discuss these improvements. That's great. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Henderson. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to uh, Allison, thank you again for a most informative presentation. The only question I have, did the owner look at alternative materials? And the one I'm thinking of, it's it's a it's a permit, it's wood, it's a board, but uh, maybe Councillor Darling can help me. I know it's a, once a color is given, the color recommended, it would have that color through the entire board, so it's not like you have to maintain it or paint it, and it comes in board, bat, and styles. And I'm just wondering, was any of that considered by the owner? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to my knowledge, there were no other materials considered. Um, this gentleman, uh, as I mentioned, he's from out of town, and uh, he has actually already made certain arrangements and purchased certain materials um, prior to going through the heritage permit process. So we're doing our best to work with him with that understanding as well. Um, he is very concerned about the cost of potential improvements. So if there were alternative materials that um, we can discuss with him, He's certainly open to those discussions, especially within the context of the application he's made for uh, support through the Community Improvement Plan. So certainly if there are alternate materials we can bring to that discussion, we'd be happy to. Councillor Sagan. Through you, Mr. Chair, to Allison. Um, I think this is an excellent, um, I guess, summary of this little building. Just out of curiosity, how long... Um, what is the history of infill of this nature in, in the town of Coburg? It seems kind of a strange put together of windows and materials and it looks to me like everybody had their eyes shut when this was first uh, designed. But I, I really applaud what you're trying to do to improve it and it certainly will make a big difference uh, for this um, building, if you could call it a building. <laughs> Um, yeah, just the history of, I see, you notice the one across the street as well. Mm -hmm. Is that, I, there's a few of them downtown, but just mm -hmm. give me a little background there. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have much more to, to say at this point. Given the very quick timeline, I really haven't had a chance to do much detailed uh, research about this uh, property or other similar ones downtown. Um, as I mentioned, the uh, Heritage Committee meeting was two days after our initial uh, meeting at the property, so it didn't really leave a lot of time for the usual research that I like to do um, in advance of these, uh, these types of permits being presented to Council. Um, what I was able to find out was that it was an alleyway. I, there really isn't much in our files, and beyond that, uh, I unfortunately just haven't had the time to look any further into it. Thanks, but as usual, you're doing a fabulous job, and I think this, yeah. this solution will be uh, a much needed improvement, so thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from members of council? Uh, seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. I have a memo from the Director of Planning and Development Services regarding an application for site plan approval development agreement for Crystal Gardens at 680 Ontario Street, Coburg. The action recommended that Council authorize preparation of the appropriate bylaws authorizing the Mayor and Municipal Clerk to execute a development agreement with Crystal Gardens Development Inc. and Lakefront Utilities Inc. for, for a residential development at 680 Ontario Street, Coburg, and further that the holding H symbol from the property known as 680 Ontario Street, Coburg, be removed. And I'd ask uh, Director McGlashan to speak to this. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, similar to uh, the last uh, site plan application, um, I, I just mentioned uh, that before you, uh, my report uh, does briefly explain the proposal and provide a, a summary of the, uh, the key uh, pieces, the uh, key points associated with the proposal. Um, however, generally, uh, the development uh, consists of a residential uh, enclave consisting of four fourplex uh, buildings and three semi-detached uh, buildings for a total uh, unit complement of uh, 22 dwelling units at 680 Ontario Street. This is uh, just um, south of Sutherland Crescent uh, from the Chipping Park uh, subdivision. And uh, this evening, um, patiently waiting, uh, is Sean Legere from RFA Planning uh, Associates who will uh, provide you with a brief overview uh, from the proponent's perspective followed by a brief uh, planning staff summary. So uh, welcome Mr. Legere to the mic. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, good evening, my name is Sean Legere, planner with RFA Planning Consultant, agent for the site plan application SPA 03-16. The application is to complete the planning approvals process to permit the semi-detached and fourplex dwellings on the subject property. If you feel like you're having deja vu, you are not mistaken. <laughs> My firm is, uh, was involved with previous planning approvals in 2013 and 2014 and 2015 for rezoning consent and site plan control for both the abutting residential and neighborhood commercial parcels and the current 22 unit proposal you are seeing today. Uh, a brief review of the Crystal Gardens project location at 680 Ontario Street as uh, already briefly introduced, uh, introduced by Glenn is bordered by Sutherland Crescent to the north, Patel Court to the east and the CN Spur Line and future Kerr Street extension to the south. Um, Save and accept the color, this site plan will be included as Schedule B in the Prospectives uh, Development Agreement. I've highlighted though the pedestrian uh, sidewalks, vehicular routes as well as the existing and proposed fencing uh, to make it easier to see from afar. Uh, generally the plan makes very efficient use of a vacant lot. All prior planning approvals for this uh, project considered it as appropriate residential infill. The Crystal Gardens uh, units will be leased to tenants on a rental basis, providing a mix of tenure uh, as well as a mix of heading, housing types to the neighborhood. In consultation with staff, a high degree of future planning has been applied to this project to accommodate the future Kerr Street extension, although it remains unclear uh, when this uh, may be, construction may begin. I wish to thank staff for their diligent assistance in this regard. Uh, the following slides are the final versions of the fourplex and semi-detached dwellings to demonstrate the architectural styling, facade articulation, and building materials intended for the Crystal Gardens development. Again, you may be getting a sense of deja vu. Uh, these will form part of the prospective uh, agreement as schedules F and G. Uh, I have included 3D renderings to give you a better sense of what the dwellings will look like. So here we have the fourplex dwelling, Schedule G semi-detached dwelling, and here's a 3D rendering of the semi-detached dwelling. Specifically, uh, Building 1, which I'll go back a second, uh, this uh, would be Building 1. We'll have frontage on Ontario Street, and special consideration of this facade includes uh, enhanced porch and window detailing along with direct sidewalk connection to Ontario Street. Overall, the project is intended to be high quality development that will reflect a positive image for the town of Coburg. I'm pleased to present the landscape plan, which will form part of Schedule H on the prospective development agreement. A total of six uh, deciduous and carnivorous tree species are proposed uh, for the uh, 0.73 hectare site along with a wide variety of evergreen and deciduous shrubs providing buffer and street tree treatments. A playground area is located centrally behind the fourplex dwellings seen here in yellow, uh, accessible to all tenants and will be buffered from the existing dwelling known as 702 Ontario Street immediately to the, uh, immediately to the west. Although the area has been allocated for play equipment, the equipment itself is exempt from site plan approval, but will be installed at the appropriate construction stage. I'm also pleased uh, the development will feature infiltration galleries, which are seen in blue. 
uh, to accommodate the stormwater management for the site in, in place of the traditional stormwater pond. A single ownership type of development, uh, as a single type ownership development, this provides a good opportunity to implement a, this type of stormwater management. The engineer was kind enough to allow the shaping of these areas for the attractive and desirable landscape of the site, landscaping of the site. Being landscaped, the tree and shrub plantings will thrive from the direct runoff uh, to these areas. Uh, finally, construction of the Crystal Gardens project is anticipated to commence late spring once all paperwork is in order. Thank you. And uh, thank you, uh, Sean. And uh, I'd just like to uh, add, and I think um, uh, Mr. Legier did uh, reference that these units uh, will be uh, rented. Uh, they will add uh, 22 units of uh, new housing units to the rental stock in Coburg, uh, along with the next site plan application that will be coming forward that's certainly uh, very, very good in today's um, tight uh, rental market. Um, also, uh, with the site situated on Ontario Street, the um, development certainly supports active transportation being on a cycling route and as well in close proximity to uh, existing transit service and um, the, uh, the the property does have meet the required zoning bylaw uh, provisions for uh, parking 38 uh, parking spaces including three barrier free um, we've provided um, in accordance with council's prior recommendations some provisions that should additional parking demand be warranted that the developer would provide additional parking spaces on site uh, as needed. And uh, finally, uh, an environmental easement uh, has been registered on the, uh, the property given the proximity of the site to, um, to the uh, CN spur line along the south. That spur line is actually the future location of the uh, Kerr Street extension. Um, of course, uh, the timing of which is possibly long term down the road. Um, however, once that Kerr Street extension is constructed, which may be 20, 30, 40, who knows how many years down the road, uh, the access to the site from Ontario Street would be closed and a new access point would be uh, opened up onto uh, the Kerr Street um, uh, road allowance. Um, and uh, I think uh, that summarizes our, uh, our report, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, certainly. This project over time on a phased basis will generate uh, approximately five uh, million dollars worth of construction uh, costs uh, as well as um, parkland levies in the amount of approximately nineteen thousand dollars and a uh, tree levy of just under fifteen hundred dollars as well um, and uh, finally if I may from a financial perspective the site uh, proposal will generate approximately one hundred and sixty six thousand dollars in development charges. Uh, so I'd certainly be happy to answer any questions along with Mr. Legier. Thank you, Director McGlashan. Uh, Mayor Bracken here. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. So um, first of all, I'm delighted to see 22 rental units coming to the town of Coburg. It's been a long time coming. Um, you know, with a 0.4 vacancy rate, it's something that we desperately need in the town of Coburg, so I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely delighted. Uh, what I had trouble with, and maybe it's because the screen is so small, I couldn't find 38 parking spaces. I found 26, and then there's six more in front of the semis, take me up to 32. So I was looking for the re remainder of the parking spaces. So that was my first question. The second question was, I didn't, I don't understand the, what uh, what is meant by should further parking be needed, the they would provide it. So maybe Mr. McGlashan, if you could answer those two questions, I'd. I would appreciate it. I'll certainly uh, give it a try, uh, Mr. Chair, um, through you to uh, the mayor. Uh, the additional six spaces that you uh, did not count are the six within the garages of the uh, semi-detached units. So those actually do count as, as parking stalls. Um, and the second question regarding future parking, um, the, uh, as the current proposal meets the minimum requirements of the zoning, they've provided that minimum. Um, however, if it's determined through um, operations and use and observations that there is an overflow of parking, um, that there are not enough spaces, uh, the provision would kick in that the developer would install additional spaces in uh, appropriate locations. So rather than over park or over supply, uh, they wanted to make uh, sure that the, the uh, supply met the demand. And if it doesn't, they will add some. So if I may, so I, I guess that means because there was not any street parking on Ontario Street because of the biking lanes, if we start to see the dog park parking fill up, we'll know that there's a problem. 
You, you're absolutely correct, uh, Your Worship. Uh, if there is spillover parking, either in neighboring subdivisions or the dog park or on the street illegally, uh, yes, there would certainly be a need to uh, add some more spaces. Deputy Mayor Henderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have uh, just two questions, either through you or our director, uh, Mr. McGlashan. Um, just to refresh my memory at the north end, uh, can you just explain, because I know there's an entry that can lead into that plaza, but can you just bring back to memory what that's about? And my second question is dealing with the north, oh, sorry, it would be the uh, east end. Um, my understanding there was a was there a berm going to be put in there initially with a wood fence, and now I see it's a black fence. Am, am I correct on that? So just those two points, Mr. Chairman. Uh, through you to, to the uh, deputy mayor. Uh, the first question regarding the uh, north access uh, driveway. That's an emergency access point uh, that is secured by an easement over that commercial property. So in the event that uh, a backup uh, access is required for fire or other emergency uh, services, uh, that they would be able to access that through, the, through a gate, I believe, um, if Mr. Legere can correct me if I'm wrong, but that, that is a secondary or emergency access only. Um, and the second question regarding the uh, east, I believe the east property line boundary. Uh, currently there is an existing berm and barrier located um, actually just east of this subject property. Um, that was provided back when the Battelle Court development was installed. So this property is actually down below the berm and uh, the fence. And the black chain link fence is actually more of a physical um, boundary line um, between the properties. So there's not really anything to buffer. It's, it's really a physical um, separation along that line only. And along the south property line as well would be black chain link since it is a railway spur. We need to make sure safety is first there. Councillor Rowden. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I'll probably a question to Mr. McLaughlin. Uh, these rental units, are they uh, uh, just a fourplex then, uh, or is there larger uh, units in them? And as I guess the mayor said it's only 0 .4, 0 .04, uh vacancy rate in Coburg, and I wonder, uh, is, it's not all of this development going to be rental, it's just a portion of it. Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Chairman, to uh, Councillor Rowden, no, all of the development will be rental, including the fourplexes and the uh, semi-detached units. They will all be rental units, yes. Councillor Darling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just, uh, I'm just looking at the uh, 3D rendering of the fourplex dwelling units and the, uh, the low uh, profile of them. Uh, I don't see any basement windows or anything. I just, are these slabs on grade? Actually, through you, Mr. Chair, I may ask Mr. Lazier to uh, follow up on that. Uh, I'm not 100 percent sure. Yes, they are slab on grade. Short All answer. The, units, the, the, uh, the four plats units will be slab on grade. Uh, obviously, they will have footings and whatnot, but yes. uh, they will be slab on grade. No basements, no crawl spaces. Okay. The semi-detached units, however, will have basements. Okay, that's what I wanted to check. Okay, thank you. Councillor Sagan. Just a quick question about the, the demographics that you uh, hope to fill these uh, rental units. It's nice to see them coming. With the playground uh, as part of your um, planning, is there any um, provision for possible senior units in there, or is it, is it expected to be just family? Maybe. Yeah. Uh, I believe it mentions in the staff report that uh, all the fourplex units on the main level will be uh, graded such that there will be no stairs to the uh, lower level units. Uh, of course, the upper level units will be walk-ups. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a certain degree of uh, consideration to the seniors market uh, for the ground floor units. Um, uh, it is anticipated that that will be the, the better part of the demographics, demographics of the development. However, um, at staff's request, we were happy to provide um, a, an area on site um, given uh, there is uh, on site to provide amenities to the tenants and uh, visitors to the site such as families to uh, the seniors uh, that would occupy um, a, a, a very good planning consideration uh, as uh, requested by staff which we were happy to provide. Thank you. Any other questions from members of council? 
Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. I have a memo from the plan, the Director of Planning and Development regarding an application for site plan amendment, amending development agreement 82 and 86 Monroe Street. The action recommended that Council authorize the preparation of the appropriate bylaws for preparation to Council which execute amendment, amending a development agreement with ECHS Inc. and Lakefront Utilities Service Inc. to permit the proposed residential development at 82 and 86 Monroe Street, Coburg. Remove the holding H symbol from the property no known as 82 and 86 Monroe Street, Coburg. And I would ask Ms. Uh, Director McGlashan to speak to this one as well. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, we are certainly pleased to provide this uh, report to you uh, summarizing the uh, proposal for um, a two-building, 66-unit uh, uh, rental apartment um, proposal at uh, 86 Monroe Street. It's actually 82 and 86 Monroe Street uh, in Coburg. Uh, the, uh, it's been a, quite a flurry in the last uh, several days or weeks with this particular development. Um, we, we do acknowledge that the um, uh, the proponent has a contractual agreement with the uh, County of Northumberland to provide or begin construction on the affordable housing uh, component of this project at 31 uh, affordable housing units. Uh, and um, the timeline or the deadline is rapidly approaching. And that's one of the reasons why this uh, application and memo was brought on to the uh, committee agenda fairly late um, because we're still working out some of the technical complex details of stormwater management and uh, on-site uh, servicing in that particular uh, issue was only resolved or somewhat resolved subject to further review um, late last Thursday. Uh, so um, again uh, similar to um, the previous proposals and presentations we do have a small uh, presentation by um, Mr. Joe Gare who represents uh, the uh, proponent um, uh, EHCS Inc. Uh, for this development and he's just going to provide a very brief uh, overview from his perspective and we'll follow up with uh, some municipal staff uh, commentary. So uh, welcome Mr. Gare to the mic. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Mayor, Deputy Mayor, thank you for having me here for a few minutes just to sort of bring you up to date on what's going on with 86 and 82 Monroe. Uh, the, um, uh, as pointed out, the project is um, 86 Monroe in particular is intended to provide uh, 31 affordable units um, uh, to Coburg. And uh, we have been moving along with the development plans uh, for this site for quite some time now. Uh, little um, uh, sidebar uh, in dealing with our uh, uh, resolution of the stormwater management. And in, in order to answer any questions, we've uh, I've requested that uh, um, our civil uh, engineer team uh, uh, attend tonight and they're here to answer any questions should any of those come up. Um, also, um, I just want you to know that I'm the part owner of it and uh, uh, Lawson Gay, who's uh, also the general contractor, is here to respond to any questions in general uh, terms about the development of the project and I'll ask him to sort of go through uh, uh, what this project is all about. Um, from my side, I just want to tell you that uh, the project is 31 units. Uh, there's a 32nd unit that is intended to accommodate uh, a full-time uh, service uh, manager uh, 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 to the site in order to be able to provide services to the individuals. It's primarily aimed at uh, accommodating seniors and individuals with disabilities, and so the project contains uh, 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 out of the 31 units, five of the units are fully accessible units to uh, provide for those types of individuals and, and to provide the accommodation that they require. Um, we've been in the seniors housing business providing housing for individuals that require a special type of housing for the last 30 years and I've uh, been happy to have deployed that, uh, uh, that knowledge and that experience in planning this project. I think it's very 
um, uh, an affordable housing project that uh, will well serve the community and you'll be proud to see it uh, built. So I'm just going to take a minute and ask uh, Lawson to talk about it and brief you through it. Thank you, everybody. Uh, much appreciated. Thanks for having us here and working with us so uh, diligently over the last few months to help us get forward. So uh, I just was going to um, just run you real quickly through, you know, the, the type of construction and stuff we're going with because we're obviously facing. It's it's kind of uh, backwards. There's there's a rail line at the back of it, so the entrance actually faces the rail line, and, and um, it has to be all masonry. So the one side's all masonry. The other three sides, as you can see, are shingles with, with the porticos and, and uh, hardy board uh, uh, EFIS type of construction we haven't finalized and, and then masonry on the on the bottom level. Um, like Joel mentioned there's there's thirty one suites, thirty second is for the uh, for the uh, for the caretaker or, or, or person for it. Um, all wood construction, uh, relatively standard finishes, nice windows, um, you know those top floors are, are gonna have a pretty nice view down over Coburg and might be able to see the lake depending on what's in front of it. We haven't been up there to look yet, so um, you know we're we're uh, we're we're quite excited about about the construction of it and and, uh, and are, are are definitely ready to get going. Um, uh, are there are there any questions at all regarding construction at all that I can I can answer or or uh, or do you want to do that at the end, Glenn? Yeah, we'll do it at the end. So, okay. Just a quick view of here. We have uh, a few more images of it. Um, sorry. Am I going the wrong way on this? Yes, yes. Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, uh, so, uh, again, a view of the building entrance, which, as was mentioned, uh, faces to the north, and, um, uh, and also a view of the driveway into it, where two buildings are um, so, uh, presented to the east and one to the west. Um, again, another image of it from a different perspective, just so that uh, you can see that the four stories are actually um, presented uh, in, a, in as low a profile as possible. Uh, so as not to uh, overpower the uh, townhouses to the south. Uh, an overview of the plan with the two buildings. Uh, you can see the access points and all the parking associated with it and the point that Lawson was making about the railway being to the north. Uh, once again, uh, a plan showing the location. And uh, this one here was intended really to show uh, how close we are to amenities. Uh, as you know, there is uh, uh, public transit to the front, uh, right, uh, right on Monroe, and several other amenities that are close by which will benefit all the residents. Uh, these are rental buildings exclusively. Um, uh, just a cutaway. Very uh, uh, economically planned building with uh, repeated uh, units all the way up and down. And um, uh, a site plan showing the entrance with a community room as well as uh, units on the ground floor uh, which reflect the ones above it. Uh, some suite layout showing the one and typical one and two bedrooms. They're comfortable units, very, uh, uh, very smartly planned. Again, uh, utilizing our knowledge in, um, in, 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 in this type of housing. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, and also uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Gear. Um, just to supplement uh, what Mr. Gear and Mr. Gay's presentation, uh, the site was actually previously uh, subject to an approved development uh, concept uh, that culminated in the uh, actual uh, development of the townhouses along Monroe Street. However, uh, the lands to the back uh, remained um, undeveloped for uh, many years, actually approximately 10 years, uh, sitting idly by until um, Mr. Uh, Gear and uh, his development company came along. Uh, so at the present, the zoning permits a maximum of 100 units per hectare. It's a very high density um, zoning designation, particularly given the uh, location abutting the, tra the, the uh, railway tracks and uh, its proximity to existing services, like Mr. Garrett mentioned. Uh, as you can see on the left side of this particular slide, uh, it actually the development mirrors an existing development just to the west, which, as 
townhouses along the uh, street front and uh, low-rise apartments uh, to the rear. So it's really modeling uh, itself after that development to the uh, west, but in a different, unique uh, style, as Mr. Garish has shown. Um, the development form will be slightly higher. Uh, it'll be approximately four stories, uh, maybe with four and a half with a raised uh, lower level. However, the, the building typology uh, has the uh, uh, mansard style of shingle roof dormer along the upper level, which actually, as, as indicated, reduces the scale and the massing of, of these types of projects, similar to um, Palisade Gardens, as uh, you see uh, his example uh, today. Um, so, uh, in terms of um, the development, Mr. Gare has advised that the uh, access is from Monroe Street by a, se a separate uh, driveway with parking um, throughout the development. Uh, there is parking uh, provided for, I believe, uh, 83 uh, parking spaces that meets the zoning bylaw provisions for residential units. Uh, and with um, the proponent's uh, market uh, for seniors, that does also reduce the number of parking spaces required uh, since uh, those with um, uh, disabilities, mobility problems, and seniors tend not to necessarily have vehicles, particularly uh, those that are affordable housing units. So there certainly is uh, ample parking uh, provided on the site. Uh, as uh, we indicated, it will, uh, this development will add 66 new rental um, housing units to the, uh, to the marketplace, 31 of them being affordable housing units under the um, uh, government funded program, but also uh, 35 market rent uh, units as well in, in, the, uh, um, in the Coburg uh, marketplace, which adding to the 22 already uh, approved this evening in Crystal Gardens, I think that'll be a, a very good addition to uh, the rental housing stock uh, in Coburg. Um, with respect to uh, buffering and such, uh, it's a very um, compact site, a uh, very um, intensified development scheme. Um, there is a uh, 1.83 meter, meter high fence, uh, wood fence along the rear of the townhouse units proposed, uh, cutting back or, or curving back towards the south along the sides of those units. Uh, also, uh, there would be uh, landscaped hedges and, and landscaped um, plantings along that uh, area as well to help buffer uh, uh, some of the, uh, the development from the existing uh, land uses. As I indicated, uh, Mr. Chair, the site does have some challenges with respect to stormwater management. Um, the, uh, the site um, is, does have some existing grading issues. There's, there's flows that are that are flowing onto the site from abutting properties. There's uh, issues of 100-year uh, storm events and, gr and beyond that, uh, that the proponent civil engineers uh, have been working with the Conservation Authority and our Public Works Department uh, to try to resolve over the last uh, several weeks. It's, it's come to a, a point where um, some of the town's engineering standards uh, needed to be examined. Uh, some of them cannot be met. Uh, they do need to um, um, do some remedial work around the site to, to make it work. Uh, so it's, it's a very tight site uh, given today's standards. Um, some of the developments around this site, particularly to the west, did not undergo that level of, uh, of detailed stormwater management design. So there's, um, there's some issues associated with that that um, uh, the Conservation Authority and our Public Works Department have, uh, have stated that the, the development um, uh, servicing scheme is uh, is doable, and they just need a few extra um, technical details to uh, to resolve before uh, before finalizing. That's one of the recommendations we have this uh, evening, Mr. Chair, is that uh, any approval be subject to the finalization of details by uh, the municipal uh, staff, particularly public works staff, and external agencies such as the GRCA. But in terms of uh, moving forward with the um, uh, council approval and the uh, continuation of paperwork and the funding arrangements through um, uh, through the upper levels of government, uh, we found it very prudent. Um, we had to move forward uh, this evening with that caveat. Uh, otherwise, the funding may um, may move elsewhere out, outside of the uh, the region. So, we certainly were very cognizant of that, and uh, I think all of the uh, staff and the proponents uh, consultants were working very dil diligently to, to get this happen get this done and make this happen. Um, just finally, a couple of things with respect to um, noise. Uh, as, as indicated, the site backs onto the railways. There is a, uh, a requirement for a berm barrier along the north property line to meet um, 
Ministry of Environment and Climate Change, as well as the railways criteria. Um, again, uh, individual um, requirements in terms of building insulation and, and cladding, such as Mr. Gay mentioned the uh, brick veneer cladding on the north side of the building. That's a noise attenuating uh, device uh, that helps um, reduce the, uh, the sound levels. And uh, finally, uh, the development certainly um, uh, as, as being very central to the community does uh, promote active transportation, walking uh, to and from uh, existing services. Downtown is in close proximity and is close to an existing uh, uh, transit route as well. Um, overall, the uh, development uh, will uh, cost approximately $4.1 million uh, in construction value and result in a parkland levy of approximately $10,600. The, uh, sorry, the, uh, the, those fees have already been paid under the previous development, but um, the uh, development charges would be approximately or just under $400,000 for this uh, particular development. So certainly um, a lot of uh, activity has occurred in the last uh, few weeks uh, culminating into uh, this evening's um, presentation and certainly myself or uh, Mr. Gehr can answer any questions that uh, may come forward. Thank you, Director Margolashen. Are there any questions from Council? Uh, Mayor Brockenier? Uh, not a question, but I'd like to make a few comments because you know, if, I, if, I, you know, if I'm delighted with the, with the 22 units that are rental properties, I'm absolutely ecstatic with this combination of market value and, and, and affordable housing. You know, we're, we're looking at 61 or 66 units uh, that we're adding to the uh, town of Coburg, very, very much needed. And uh, so I think it's really, you know, it's really exciting that we're starting to get some interest now in rental housing again in Coburg. And as far as the affordable housing uh, component is, putting on my county hat, I can tell you that I was, I was very pleased to see that Joe Gare was the, the person selected through a very stringent RFP proposal uh, for the affordable housing project uh, based on his uh, very strong background and reputation with Palisade Gardens. Uh, you know, it, it made in, in, and everything that he had to offer uh, from that experience certainly made him the number one uh, on, on the selection list. So I'm so happy that we're moving forward with this. And I do want to say to staff, uh, our, our staff as well as the GRCA, uh, how much I appreciate the fact that they've worked so diligently on this in a compressed time frame to get it to this very, very important deadline tonight. Because tonight was the deadline we had to get to in order to move this project forward. So to all involved, thank you very much for that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'd like to echo that comment as well. And there's been a tremendous amount of work done, even though there was a long, uh, long weekend, etc. There was work done over that period of time. Sorry to interrupt the order. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor Henderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you or through uh, Director McGlash, and uh, because of the sensitivity of this project, especially attached to affordable housing. Um, in, when construction starts, would it actually start with Building B because of that, uh, because of the high requirement and uh, deadlines? Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, my understanding is that the first uh, building, the first phase, will be the affordable housing project on the uh, east side, northeast side of the uh, site. Mr. Gare can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that's correct. That's correct. Deputy Mayor Henderson. It just a subsequent question. Just the package that I have, Mr. McGlashan, in my notes that was handed me tonight, uh, because I know sometimes uh, the 3D can be d deceiving. Uh, the pictures I'm looking at are what it's going to look like in this package. Is this the one that's accurate? That is correct. Uh, th those are the correct elevations. Okay, thank you. Councillor McCarthy. Thank you. Um, uh, just a comment through Councillor Burkett to all involved. Uh, another aspect of this project that I think is quite wonderful is the location of the uh, project inside of a diverse, dynamic neighborhood. Uh, it, it, when we talk about seniors housing, 
sometimes they can be pocketed and, and isolated into um, their own group, which can work for some people. But uh, when I was looking at your amenities that the community offered, I'd also like to point out Tracy Park and the community garden. There would probably be seniors that may enjoy getting involved with gardening opportunities just down the street, uh, even though they live in a... In a and an apartment type environment uh, but I just love the idea that um, they can walk to get all their food um, and and most of their services are nearby so it, it seemed counterintuitive of, a, of an apartment building by the railway track but just living one block south of that I don't know you get used to it it doesn't it's just part of the rhythm of the neighborhood so um, I'll look forward to meeting these folks shortly bye bye thank you Chair Brackenier. Yeah, thank you, Chair uh, Burkett. Just one thing I would like to add about the uh, investment affordable housing project from the county. So every time there's money coming forward to the county for investment in affordable housing, they go through a process to identify where in the county the greatest need is. And then once they've identified that, they also identify what's the dem demographic that's required. So in this particular case, the Coburg was identified as the, as the community needing the affordable housing and uh, seniors was the demographic also identified in that. So that fits um, fits very well with the uh, you know the work that Joe is doing over in Palisade Gardens and has it allowed him to take some of the uh, some of the services he offers over there and combine it with the investment in affordable housing tenants. It's uh, it uh, kind of put them over the top in the selection process. Councillor Rowden. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I echo those thoughts, the fact that we're getting some affordable housing in town, and that uh, that's great. Uh, the one thing I think I'd like to hear from is our, our uh, Director of Public Works, and when you mentioned stormwater management, and I know it's a very serious pro problem all across uh, the province and probably all across the world right now, but uh, I know that there's uh, we're doing a uh, pond north of the railway, uh, and sometime in the next year or two, and there's a, a lot of studies being done about that. But uh, I'd like to know just exactly where direction do this water, storm water runs? Does it run towards the Midtown Creek, or is it being uh, routed somewhere else under the ground? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, <clears throat> the stormwater drainage from the site will, will eventually go to uh, Midtown Creek. Uh, I think it goes over to uh, probably drains into it in the neighborhood of Park Street. Um, but the study that we, we need to have completed and, and a little bit more information on uh, is, is a demonstration that the existing buildings are not going to be flooded in a heavy rainstorm. That, that, that's our responsibility to make sure that that doesn't happen. So the stormwater issue in this case is exactly that, and we just need a little bit more information uh, from the developer that, that uh, definitely demonstrates that, that we'll be safeguarded in that respect. And, and if I may again, there's no yep. guarantees on flooding because I've saw that happen in Burlington and Toronto in the last two or three years. Being on the Conservation Authority, I've saw a lot of big, of, uh, of films showing that it uh, does happen. But I'm just like, kind of curious: is our uh, stormwater? probably in, in the event of any construction how likely should be increased because of that. Thank you. Are there any other questions from members of council? Councillor Zagan. Thank you, Chair Burkett. Uh, I think through to you to the mayor, um, sitting on council, on county's council, um, is there an allocation of affordable housing units specifically for Coburg and where would this 31 units fit in that allocation? So uh, the, the way it works is the province will give us a certain amount of money for to the county for affordable housing recognizing that there's a need for for affordable housing throughout the county. Uh, so when they gave us the money, they, actually what they gave us was uh, uh, 4.1 million dollars and uh, we used up 600,000 of that in, in subsidized rents over a period of time for people who just couldn't afford to pay their rent, which left us, left us with uh, uh, $3.5 million basically for the, uh, for the, for the project. So the, that's, that's when the county goes to work, as I said, and they, de they determine where the greatest need is. But they're also looking for 
uh, a location where there are services for people, such as transit, hospitals, shopping. And so that narrows it, again, that narrows it down pretty quickly because not all the municipalities in the county have that off to, to offer. But uh, so Coburg set was identified as having the most need for affordable housing, and seniors were the big demographic, so that's where that will be the population of that uh, new affordable housing unit. Any other uh, questions from members of council? Seeing none, I'll go call for the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Okay, Councillor uh, Sagan, uh, the very last item on the agenda belongs to you. Thank you, Your Worship. A uh, memo from the memo from the community events coordinator regarding the approval of municipal event application Touch Rugga uh, Coburg Beach tournament submitted by the Coburg Rugby Club. The action recommended is that council approve the Touch Rugga Touch Rugby tournament to be held on Saturday, May 13th, 2017, on Victoria Beach, Coburg. And uh, doing a little research in in uh, the uh, um, uh, I guess the coordinator from Lara Scott who does an excellent job in vetting these these uh, different events to make sure that they don't conflict with what's going on. It's interesting that there are 63 rugby teams across uh, um, eastern Ontario so it's it's a new thing and I was talking to director Huswick and you mentioned that this is before the regular rugby teams um, uh, actually play this year so there should be no conflict. Madam Chair, uh, there won't be any conflict. I think a lot of these players uh, might also be uh, players that uh, um, prefer touch as opposed to the full contact, so there's, there's a bit of crossover. And it's certainly before the, uh, the busy summer season begins, so there will be uh, less impact on uh, users of the beach as well. Any questions from anyone on Council? Come on, guys, this is an important issue. I want a question. If not, I'll call the vote. All in favor? Carried. Okay, Deputy Mayor Henderson. Thank you, Worship. Uh, the Council meeting closed session in accordance with Section 239 of the Municipal Act, SO 2001, regarding personal matters about identifiable individual, including municipal and local board employees, regarding the Heritage Advisory Committee applications and a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of lands by the municipality or local board and then offer to purchase. All in favor? Oh, I'm sorry, discussion first. Okay, all in favor of going into closed session and it's carried. You have a question before adjournment, uh, yes, Councilor yes, McCarthy. Yes, I just I, I, I'm just want direction um, on our um, agenda. The presentation by um, on about the railway crossings had a motion we didn't vote on, and I just wondered if that needs to be. Oh, I'm just looking at my that council refer the matter to staff for report. Oh, no, we're not doing that. No. No. That council receive the report as information. No, no. I just saw it in writing. I wondered if that was over, overlooked. Thank I, you. I, I did take the opportunity to talk to Mr. Lamarchant prior to his presentation to let him know that you know the uh, the conditions that we are under as a council, and I, they did send that out earlier today. I'm not sure if you read that or not. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. I did. I just didn't know if the action had to be dealt with, but thank you. Motion to adjourn. Councillor Burkett. 